in the same way that Welsh Gaelic is, in the same way that other spoken languages are. We want our language to be prote protected and preserved and for the risk to its demise to be reduced. So the BSL bill will protect our language into the future. It will show that uh, we belong here, that we have a spiritual home in Scotland. That's why legislation is important to promote and preserve the language. I, and BSL, of course, as, as, you're, as you become very well aware, is a language. The British Deaf Association published this dictionary many years ago, providing definitive evidence that this is a full language that needs to be recognized and accepted as a language alongside the other languages of Scotland. Can I just add something um, about it being a language? It is part of our everyday lives um, and it needs to be part of the way that we access um, services. Deaf people are hugely frustrated and depressed because of the barriers and the problems that we face um, in respect of linguistic access to what is going on. And, you know, deaf people just want I improved quality of life, improved access to the services that we need. Okay. I understand the points that you make about the, the language and how um, it's important to recognise that as such. However, the bill stops short of setting clear rights for BSL users or duties on public authorities. Do you think that's a limitation to the bill? And many people have said in, in their responses to the committee that they see the bill as a stepping stone. Um, do you feel that? And do you think that that's enough um, at the moment with this bill? Okay, um, Frankie. Yeah. I think um, realistically we would love to have more. Uh, I and mean, I think we're all agreed on that. Um, we've had years of, of uh, problems, but we would like to grab the opportunity that, uh, that has uh, been presented to us. And I think it is a first step. Um, it is a lot better than uh, what we have at present. Um, I know that there are authorities who are quite sort of um, concerned, anxious maybe about this. And I think this would be a really good first step um, to get something on the statute books, um, a good, useful first step. Yeah. I think we can look at the bill as something that opens the door, if you like, for deaf people and, and our language. And like Frankie said, it's a very first step. Um, this is you know, a pioneering piece of legislation in terms of the United Kingdom. And so we, we welcome it with open arms and we're ready to roll up our sleeves and do the hard work and to build on you know, the national plan as it's stated or statements of intent has already been mentioned so that the authorities can have clear uh, plans about um, work plans and what's going to work for us. We are prepared to um, wait for quality. Um, we are, I think that's important. And the, the community has a very, very positive attitude to this and we do want to move forward. I'd like to just agree with what um, Avril and Frankie have just said. I think it's really important. Um, it will be an important step to the improvement of services. Um, and it will be gradual, you know, things will build from this. Um, other organisations um, may become involved, um, hopefully businesses as well will follow suit. Um, you know, it's the 21st century, it, it is time for us to move forward. Yes, Helen. Yep, I would agree. I think what's going to be important is that the national plan has a very clear um, vision and can be linked to outcomes. That's going to be vital, that um, the scene is set by the national plan and that we have the right mechanisms in place uh, in relation to monitoring and reviewing those local plans. But importantly, that the national plan sets out a really, really clear vision to help us achieve what we need to with this bill. But I agree uh, very much uh, a stepping stone and very welcomed by all of us. Can I, um, if you like, play devil's advocate, um, which is one of my favourite things to do, but I mean, is the bill anything more than symbolic in its nature? I mean, effectively, it doesn't provide any more resources, it doesn't change anything particularly, it doesn't provide any more interpreters or translators. Is it nothing more than a symbol? Nic Nicola. 
Um, I think in, in terms of, of interpreting, um, it will hopefully enhance the need for quality interpreters and more interpreters. Um, universities and colleges need to make sure that, uh, services that are their services are accessible. I think that's right. I think it could be symbolic, but I think it's a powerful symbol, and that's why we're all here. You know, we're here, we're using BSL face to face with you. You know, uh, you had however many kind of uh, contributions to your Facebook page. I think that is evidence that it's a very powerful symbol. When you say, you know, is it merely symbolic? Well, I, I think what it offers is perhaps a framework, a, a skeleton on which we can then put the flesh on and develop as time goes on. The national plan will hopefully ca cascade down to those local authorities, but you've got to have a framework, you've got to have a, a structure within to put um, these uh, ideals, aspirations, and eventually uh, service expectations. So um, the fact that it's about our language and the recognition of our language, and that is the focus of it, rather than our disability, our uh, linguistic rights, I would say that's a pretty good symbolic start. Can I just ask one follow, further follow-up question before I, I bring in the next member of the committee? You mentioned, Frankie mentioned at the start about the Equality Act um, from 2010. Um, you seem to be suggesting that that was not sufficient to meet the kind of objectives that you're hoping that the, the BSL bill will meet. Um, could you maybe expand on that a little bit, um, why the Equalities Act is insufficient? to meet the objectives that uh, you hope that the BSL bill will? Yes, well, um, I have a social work background and a personal experience as well. And I see horror stories every day um, occurring with deaf people, people who are going in to hospital, who are sort of waiting for hours or months even without really knowing what's going on in terms of their treatment, people who have problems accessing um, college courses and who withdraw from college education because there is no provision for them. Um, people who think, um, the, the experiences that you take for granted on an everyday basis are problematic for deaf people. Um, some p deaf people, for example, have um, got into debt because of lack of understanding of some of the information that's been sent to them in written English. They see letters uh, in English, they ignore them because they don't understand them, they then get into debt, uh, their situations become more and more um, problematic. Um, you know, they end up in crisis before any um, help is asked for. Um, and for, because of data protection, um, it is very hard for them to interact with financial services and institutions through a third party, like through an interpreter or through um, another representative who wants to act on their behalf. Um, and the Equalities Act is not dealing with this. Um, people and organisations find ways of working around the Equalities Act. Also, the Equalities Act talks about reasonable adjustment. And it's very hard to define what that actually means. Um, and a lot of organizations will say that those adjustments that might be reasonable for deaf people are too expensive, um, particularly when it comes to, to language issues. Um, and so the adjustments that deaf people need are deemed not reasonable. Um, and, and this is really a loophole in that legislation. Um, you know, if I want to go to a solicitor um, who has to pay for the interpreter? You know, I do. Um, uh, legal aid won't cover. They, they cover the first appointment, um, the costs of, but not the interpreting costs. If I want to buy a house, you know, I need to uh, interact with a lawyer. Um, legal aid doesn't cover that. Um, so, you know, what do I do when I want to buy a house, for example? So those are just um, some very quick examples. I could go on for hours um, and give you some real horror stories of, of experiences that deaf people have had. Before I bring in Nicola and Avril, I just want to pursue this for one second. I know we'll get into the, some of the detail of this in a moment, but 
You just gave a number of examples, Frankie, about people getting into debt or trying to buy a house, for example, and, and how the Qualities Act obviously doesn't in any way help with any of these day-to-day -day situations. But how, will, how do you believe that the BSL bill will help with those everyday situations? In what way will the BSL bill prevent somebody from getting into debt, for example? Um, awareness of the language needs of deaf people and to make sure that information is accessible in that language. Um, and the, the recognition that BSL is a language because people really don't understand what BSL is all about. You know, they, they maybe don't think of it and consider it as a proper language. It's just people sort of, you know, waving their hands around. Um, so they don't consider linguistic issues when they think about BSL. And I think about having this legislation would identify it as a language, would recognize that the, the the issues for BSL users are to do with language and linguistic access, um, and also to celebrate, you know, the richness of that language. Um, you know, at the moment, deaf uh, people, organisations can ignore that, um, and I think, uh, you know, we want to uh, access life through using our own language, and I think um, legislation. Uh, that encourages a, a change of attitude towards the language and identifies it as a language is necessary. Nic uh, Nicola and then Alvin. I just uh, like to agree with what Frankie says through my own personal experience. You know, in going to the bank and sitting down with a financial advisor um, in dealing with transactions to do with my house, I had similar problems just accessing, you know, the fundamental information. You know, people saying, well, you need to come back in, in two weeks. That's when we can do something. It's like, well, I need access to that information right now. So I, I often uh, felt that there were a lot of barriers and it was very difficult for me in those areas of my life. Uh, similarly, um, you know, the, in going, visiting the tax office website, um, trying to uh, deal uh, uh, with uh, written language, uh, informing people of my own language needs, um, that lack of awareness, the lack of fundamental awareness, you know, means that you just often, you, you give up. And deaf people end up uh, having to go and do things face to face, losing, you know, taking more time, you know, and not having real equality of access. So um, I, I think, like Frankie says, that attitudinal and cultural shift that's brought about by a promotional bill may well help. Really... When you talk about the Equality Act, you say it, it does work for some people, but it clearly isn't working for the sign language using deaf community. Um, Frankie uh, mentioned reasonable adjustment earlier on. Um, that whereby services can provide, you just write things down on a bit of paper rather than uh, providing an interpreter, which resorts back to English, which doesn't give us the full access via our preferred language. A bill like this can, can state that provision of services in BSL uh, is uh, something that, that, that deaf people should have. We've talked about reasonable adjustment not working. The British Deaf Association uh, in 2014 did carry out a wide-ranging survey, which I have here, into the uh, legal status um, of British Sign Language and um, uh, ISL, Interna uh, uh, Irish Sign Language. And the, the clear results, and the proof is here, I'm happy to supply this to the committee if you want, is that the Equalities Act is not working for sign language using deaf people. If you also look at page seven um, of this report, in the last paragraph, we talk about the very important area of education for deaf children. When you ask um, MSPs and MPs, you know, whether uh, deaf children will receive uh, an, uh, their education in sign language, the overwhelming response is, well, of course that's the case. But the Grimes report in 2009 uh, says something quite contrary. 8% of teachers of the deaf can sign. 8%? Well, that means 92% can't. So how are these children accessing their education? How are they setting up the foundations for their well-being and their future? We need an act that states that children should be educated 
in the language and the culture uh, that they belong to, giving them full access to information. So we need a separate act, a be it, something that, that, an act that has British Sign Language in its title. That may well lead to future access and future provision for the deaf community. Thank you. I want to bring in um, some of the committee now because I know there's a number of questions that members have. Can I start with uh, Colin? Thank you, Mayor. Um, some organisations have expressed concern that uh, the bill uses up scarce resources. And if I can quote from COSLA, uh, they state there's a risk it will become simply a, an, an expensive bureaucratic exercise. Can I ask the panel, if they had a choice, would they be spending the resources on developing plans or would they rather have the resources spent in another way, more effectively supporting BSL users? It's just a very open question. When we're talking about spending, we need to think about, at the moment, the government is spending an awful lot on deaf people. Most deaf people don't work. They try to find work, but they don't. So they're on benefits. Um, you know, so they're not actively contributing to our economy. They're excluded from that. So an investment now, as a result of this bill, will uh, save money in the long term in terms of services um, to deaf people. If people are able to interact and contribute to the economy more, then there will be other costs that will be saved later on. For example, mental health and in education. Um, if we don't do anything now, there will be increased costs. Um, later on as a result. But if we invest in trying to ensure that deaf people are active members of society, um, are able to share their experiences, their knowledge with other members of society, then we will all benefit. is timely. Um, it comes alongside um, the National Sensory Impairment Strategy as well. Uh, it comes at a time when we've got a focus on the attainment gap for, for deaf learners. I think as Frankie says, it's a stepping stone. It really allows us to have a focus um, on children and young people and on a whole range of issues um, for deaf people in Scotland that will help support better outcomes for, um, for people and an investment in the future. So I think the timing of the bill is very good in relation to other areas of focus, but I think in particular, this focus that we now have on the attainment gap that exists for, for deaf children and on some of the issues that have been raised in the, the recent CRIDE survey, which you know, have been picked up upon uh, earlier around about qualifications um, for teachers of the deaf, consistency of support for uh, deaf learners in Scotland too. So I think that issue around about timing and the plans being absolutely right in terms of the kind of issues that they're capturing and a real focus on improving the outcomes for, for deaf children and ultimately for deaf adults. When you, when you talk about the cost and the expenditure as you have, as has been said, this, is, this could be a strategic investment for the long term to save public money. If we give deaf people the quality start in life, then they will, like Frankie said, contribute. There's a lot of misdirected and unstrategic spending on the deaf community that's going on at the moment. Now, what we, what we would like to see is a cross-department, cross-party, you know, joint working together so that we actually target and strategize because we see an awful lot of duplication and repetition of services. You know, um, for example, um, across uh, the NHS and the other public services with the, the advancement of technology and the increasing of online services, th this isn't done in a, in, a, in a centralized way that could easily work in Scotland where we join the dots between these services so that we have a full, comprehensive, cohesive picture giving us value for money for each pound we spend. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with Frankie that an investment now will make all of us, not the deaf community, but the whole of Scotland better off in the future. 
point that uh, Avril made uh, in relation to the current spending uh, for BSL. I will seem to be indicating that uh, it, it wasn't being spent perhaps as wisely as it should be. Perhaps you could add a little bit to that. Okay, for example, um, with the NHS services uh, across uh, Scotland, uh, they very much have their own individual uh, localised plans of how they're going to meet uh, deaf people's needs. And if they actually uh, joined up, for, for example, with interpreting services um, on the access via technology, if it was done in a centralised way, rather than uh, all these pots of money being drained locally, if we planned these things properly uh, in the first place, um, I'm, 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 I'm sure you would agree with me that, that uh, well, we'd have an economy of scale. It would just make sense. Is, it, does that answer your question? Where Apple's coming from. Yeah, can I just add to that? that the number of PSL users in different areas um, varies widely. In some areas, there'll be a, a large a number of deaf people, in others, uh, they will be very few and far between. Having a centralised system um, will be far more cost effective, I'm sure. And can I just add, um, it's occurred to me that another example uh, that might illustrate is when you look at deaf children in schools across Scotland, there is an awful lot of expenditure on uh, itinerant and visiting teachers of the deaf that, that can't sign very well, as I've already said, um, the communication support workers that aren't trained very well and giving ineffectual support. So if we actually uh, strategically employed uh, deaf people uh, to uh, support our deaf students, not, it would be a lot cheaper than, uh, and cost effective and, and, and give much better outcomes, uh, you know, which is far more important. As I explained earlier, a lot of the so-called professionals working in this area don't have the sign language skills necessary to meet the needs of, these deaf, of, the, of the deaf students. So what we would like to see, you know, is really as able to exploit the potential of the deaf community um, and, and our uh, skills and experiences to, to bring up our children in the way that they deserve. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Can I, can I just ask Alan whether, um, given his, his, he's representing here younger people today, if he has a view on this? You know, young deaf people often live very isolated lives in terms of their family, their, their, their social life, their education. They find it difficult to get good employment outcomes. They're underemployed. They can't, they can't get promotion. And there's, there really is, I, I can't emphasize many areas of improvement. Um, as I've said, you know, for example, job interviews uh, can be incredibly difficult um, for deaf people um, to, uh, to, to um, navigate very well. But uh, of, often, you know, I employers uh, uh, and uh, educational establishments have a, an, an attitude uh, that, that is extremely unhelpful uh, to deaf people's needs. And then a bill like this that states uh, uh, the, the language rights of deaf people will go a long way to improving that. Okay, thank you. In the panel, what they understand by the term promotion of BSL, what specific things should, should that entail what should, what should be included in that promotion yes Alan well when you look at promotion of BSL what it means to me is it, it, well well first of all it's been said earlier it proves that it's a language so education establishments and employers you know you know hopefully we'll have an attitudinal uh, shift uh, that, I mean I think that's and a cultural shift. I think that's the, the first key step. And a promotion, I think, can also mean much more of a, an acceptance uh, of the access needs of deaf people throughout our society. In my experience, um, it's not only uh, deaf people who might benefit, uh, but hearing people too. Um, 
hearing people are usually fascinated when they're exposed to BSL uh, and very keen to learn more. Um, but they have a limited choice in where they can go and learn that. And, and often they're disappointed because things aren't accessible um, in their locality. And I think uh, the potential for having BSL on the curriculum, for example, uh, would improve uh, the awareness of hearing people. It would improve their language skills. Uh, they could become bilingual as well in English and BSL. And that would mean that there would be far more um, interaction between sort of deaf and hearing people. It would be really useful. It could be um, fun for hearing people. Uh, would involve a lot more interaction um, and involvement uh, within the wider society for deaf people. And I think um, promotion of BSL uh, would certainly involve promotion promoting the learning of it uh, with hearing people. Okay. I think it's like I've already said, the dictionary uh, a couple of decades ago um, recognized our language as having its own grammar, syntax, and structure, uh, putting it on an absolute equal footing with any other language. Um, so uh, t I think we, we've, we all agreed that this is a recognized language. It's not just gestures or mimes. Uh, and, for me, promotion means, I think, well, Frankie's, Frankie's already mentioned, you know, the national, uh, our national curriculum. It would be terrific to, to recognize the benefits that sign language can confer. I mean, I mean, for somebody to grow up bilingual, their career opportunities, you know, not only in that language, of course, they could work as a social worker or an interpreter w within the language group. Um, we'd have the cost effect and effectiveness of that, but bilingualism is good anyway. In terms of uh, deaf people um, having uh, partners, family members, I don't know if you know that 95% plus deaf children are born to hearing families. So if we promote this language within the wider community, when people have deaf children, th they're going to be able to communicate at least fundamentally with them. So the quality of life it, that it would promote, that's what I think of when I think of promotion. And we keep going back to this, but changing attitudes, gaining acceptance, you know, the, you know respecting our language um, uh, you know, on a par with other spoken languages, that's a really important principle and it means that deaf Scottish people will feel that they truly belong in their own country. Okay, thank you. Um, could you be very brief because we've got a lot to get through, Heather. Dingwall Academy and the, the One Plus Two initiative there where um, students are, are learning BSL uh, as a second language and perhaps that being one of an opportunity, certainly a great example of good practice. Thank you very much. Col Colin, are you finished? Thank you. Um, James. Thank you, convener. Good morning. The, a number of comments suggested there could be some unintended consequences of the bill. Uh, and primarily it could have a detrimental effect on the available res resources to support people with other communication needs. Do, would you agree with, with that? Uh, could, it, could other communication needs for deaf people be negatively uh, affected by the BSL bill? And if so, in what ways? Frankie. I think at the moment, uh, BSL should be an option for anyone who chooses to use it. Um, but it's really not an option uh, because of lack of resources, lack of support and so on. Um, so BSL is often an option for families with deaf children that they don't take up. Um, and as Avril said, um, the vast majority of deaf children are born into hearing families. Hearing families who don't know how to communicate with their child, um, who don't know where to go and learn BSL and maybe not advised to do that. Um, deafness obviously covers a whole broad range of individuals who, who will communicate in different ways. Not all will use sign language. Some will lip read and speak, for example, and that's fine. I'm thinking about how many of those would actually welcome the opportunity to, to learn BSL if it was available to them. Um, and I'm confident that a lot more people would actually access uh, BSL tuition if, if they were able to do so. Because hearing loss can have a profound effect on the lives of individuals, um, can really um, impact on their ability to communicate and so on, can uh, cause a, a great deal of frustration and often depression. Um, uh, often uh, single parents, for example, who uh, lose their hearing uh, 
will have hugely problematic issues communicating with their children. Um, it can involve a lot of stress. Uh, people can really struggle in their individual circumstances. And I think having B BSL as an option that, that is accessible um, for more people to learn would actually benefit a lot of hard of hearing people as well. It would give them another choice um, that could help them access um, services Sorry, and can I life. Can so I, I think it, it could be very positive for other people. Can I interrupt for a second? I mean, I think um, Mr. Donnan's question wasn't so much about the, the response that uh, Mr. McLean just gave uh, and the benefits. I think many of us recognise the benefits if it was widely available. The question is directly about the impact on resources. If the resource allocation for um, a deaf community within a council or other communication um, needs um, is limited, if it's a fixed pot of money, I think the question, I'm paraphrasing here, but the question is effectively about what, what would the impact be on that pot of money if some of it had to be used because of legislation for example, for the plans and the promotion, et cetera. If that was, because I, I'm, not, I'm not confident at the moment that there would be extra money provided to do this, that the money would remain the same, but some of the money would then have to be allocated for promotion, et cetera. What would the impact be on BSL users then? I think that's, I'm paraphrasing the question. I was actually going to come back in and, and yeah. make exactly the point you made, convener. Sorry. So I don't know whether Frankie would maybe respond directly to that point. I think, sorry, I was, I was uh, emphasising the positives, um, and I know that there are concerns about this. The on, honest answer is we don't know, but I think uh, when I consider the spending that is, is, is uh, happening at the moment in relation to deaf people, um, I think that there would be a lot um, of savings. For example, um, there isn't much spending on lip reading <laughs> classes at the moment, um, so yeah, the, the spending is, is the other way around. There is more spending on BSL users than there are on the other groups of deaf people. The, op the opposite. Sorry. <laughs> Interpreter's mistake. Um, Frankie's, Frankie's last point was that he believes that the current suite of services that are available, if you look at it right now, there's much more spending on the other forms of communication than BSL. Okay. That's the status quo at the moment. Right, okay. Sorry. Um, no. No. That's no. not. <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> okay. No, just to clarify. At the moment, other communication methods, um, we're not totally sure what the spending is on them, but I actually don't think that there is that much spending on them anyway. Um, I, I'd like to say that, you know, a BSL bill would would, would make B the BSL needs more visible because I'd, I feel that they're not visible enough within that spectrum of needs and services to meet those needs. Okay. I don't think there would be any negative effects at all, to be honest. I think what we have to bear in mind is that BSL is a language. All the, all the other communication needs you're talking about, you I mean, sign-supported English, that's not a language. Um, it, it's an artificial communication system. Um, Makiton that's available, I don't know if you're aware of that, that's for people who have got special needs um, on top of you know, additional disabilities perhaps. So there shouldn't really be any negative unintended uh, effects. I mean, if we consider the amount of funding that's been given to cochlear implantation over the last uh, few decades, well, if we can spend money in that direction, we can certainly, via a bill, um, point people and, and, and direct them to spending in this way. I, I, there should not be any negative effects at all. Um, we're talking about, you know, a language issue here as distinct um, from, I mean, the, the, other, the other services are for people who don't use that language. So um, I think that there, there, there are two separate issues and this is, it, it, it would be good for us to focus on the language side of things. Um, we talked about the see here um, strategy and what's going ahead. I mean, we're obviously very supportive of, uh, you know, having a very wide and open attitude to the spectrum of deafness and the services, but I, I have a very strong belief uh, that a BSL bill would have no negative unintended consequences. Okay, thank you. Heather. Can I just 
say that we are, as an organisation, seeing um, quite significant cuts in sensory services right across Scotland. And I think we do actually need to be aware um, that there is some potential um, for financial resources to be diverted away from uh, additional support required, for example, for um, deaf children in the classroom, particularly around about communication support workers, radio aids, um, improved acoustics. So I do think seeing the situation right across Scotland just now and seeing the constraints and budgets that we do actually need to be cautious around about that. Come back to you then on that, Heather. Yes. Have you got any suggestions about how we can mitigate those circumstances? Some uh, funding attached to the bill. <laughs> One response. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do believe that, um, that, that the bill will require funding and resourcing, um, given the fact that we know there to be inconsistencies across Scotland and we know there to be gaps in services just now. I think services are working incredibly hard just now um, to build capacity and to use resources as effectively as possible, but we are seeing significant cuts to budgets and real um, pressures on, on councils just now. So my concern would be unless there's financial resources attached to the bill, it may well be difficult to um, fulfill the obligation. Do you think the bill should include specific reference to the needs of deaf, blind BSL users, and if so, in what way? Good, um, because deaf, blind people um, are deaf primarily, and then they will lose their vision uh, later in life. They, they are people who rely on BSL. Yes, I think at the moment, um, deaf-blind communication might involve a hands-on tactile form of BSL. That is BSL anyway. So basically what we're talking about is BSL. Um, it's just a, a different form of BSL. Um, I, I'm not a, a sort of a linguistic academic, and so maybe other people can tell me if I'm wrong there. I think, like Frankie said, you know, deafblind people have, uh, you know, are a distinct group within our community and have their own uh, extra needs. Uh, I, I think what's important is to just make sure that they are included in this. It, 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 if we're talking about including the deaf community within the wider society, then we also need to consider how the deafblind minority within the deaf community is part of that picture. Thank you. Uh, Liz Smith. Morning. Um, obviously, as the bill stands just now, there is a proposal uh, that there should be uh, one minister who has a specific responsibility for BSL. And the Scottish Government has come back and said that actually all ministers should have responsibility because of the uh, collective role that their portfolios uh, have. Uh, could I just ask you whether you do feel that there should be a specific minister with responsibility? And, and if so, what additional benefit that could bring? would like to see is a minister being given primary um, responsibility to oversee that whole picture, to take the lead on British Sign Language flowing from an act um, of, of Parliament. But, I mean, we'd like to have our cake and eat it, I suppose. You know, we'd like cross-department uh, cross and cross-party support for this so that there is a, a synergy between the head and the heart and, and the actual uh, services that are then provided. So we, we'd like that strong overview and leadership um, so that somebody is accountable for it, but that they would then delegate um, those responsibilities across all departments. Um, this, would, this would benefit um, ev all parts of that equation because there would be a clear roadmap, a clear strategy of who's responsible for what, but that oversight we feel is a very important aspect. It would also be cost effective I mean, don't forget that we're, we're talking, hopefully, about having a national advisory group that would work in very strong cooperation with all government departments to ensure that we take the right path in, uh, the f in ensuring a, a better future. 
uh, I'm sure yourselves have, have uh, you know, you've been looking in depth at all the paperwork in relation to this bill. Um, and you probably have a much more in-depth knowledge about it than other ministers here. Um, and I think it would be really invaluable to have somebody who, who has accrues um, a, a, an in-depth knowledge about BSL and about the processes and the, the needs involved. Uh, follow up on this point because if there is an advisory body, a national advisory body, and there is also a minister with responsibility, could you be clear about what each of the roles would be? How would the minister's role differ from that of the national advisory group? I'll briefly respond to that. I think there are a lot of issues that need to be discussed and that, that the advisory group would be the place for those discussions to take place, to um, benefit from individuals' experiences and so on. But the minister is the person who needs to kind of take that overview, um, summarise the thoughts of the advisory group, present them to parliament. Um, the advisory group is where the, the discussions can happen um, and feed into the process and, and that will be done through the minister. Just be clear about that uh, answer. If it is the responsibility of the minister to set the priorities, would it be your expectation that these priorities come from the national advisory body? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. What I would like to stress, I mean, we've talked about the minister obviously taking the lead in terms of parliament and legislation. Uh, and a, the advisory group, what we would like to see is that group really represented, say, in a majority, 75% or more of experts within the field who have a connection with the community, with what's going on, so that um, we provide the link between the plans, the, the, the bridge, if you like, between what's, what the plans uh, and feed in um, to what's uh, the, the strategy from the actual needs of the community. So if you ensure that there is that 75% of vast majority of Scottish deaf BSL users in that group, I mean, and you, you, obviously organizations like COSLA and the others need to be part of those lengthy discussions. But, you know, if you look at formulating a national plan uh, and supporting authorities to do that plan, you know, members of that group could provide that very vital link between the national parliament and all those uh, th those services that are being rolled out across the country. I hope that's clear, is it? Can I just finish on the point, there must be an expectation on other portfolios in government that this has an impact, whether it runs across education, it runs across health, it runs across social responsibility. I I'm just slightly nervous about one minister having that responsibility. I think that's the point the Scottish Government's making. Would you see any uh, way forward of trying to ensure that there is a collective responsibility on this? I'm, I'm not sure I'm really going to answer that, but if we look at the Gallic uh, model, um, and just consider whether or how effective that is um, in relation to this. And then maybe either if it's effective, follow the same model and if it's not, do something different. <laughs> just linked to what Fr Frankie just said, if we spread the responsibility around, then it's spread perhaps too thin. We, we would like to see some sort of accountability, a, a shared responsibility, if you like. There's one, one minister that takes the lead because it is a promotional bill um, and, and they, they take the lead over the other departments but the advisory group provides that vital link to local authorities and services and like Frankie says I mean we can look at the spoken language models and see if they will apply and if they work to the British Sign Language situation. Okay can I um, ask about a particular issue that was raised in effect by uh, the Scottish Government. The Scottish Government suggested the requirement to 
uh, for, sorry, for listed authorities to publish a, a plan should be replaced with the requirement to publish a BSL statement. Um, I just wondered whether the panel felt that a statement would be a better way of uh, driving improvement and measuring progress than a, than a plan. <laughs> I actually think um, that it's important that it is plans and that those plans have momentum and that there's accountability um, for those plans and that we can see progress uh, towards the bill. I think there's a bit of a fear um, if it's a statement that it could be a, a tick box exercise. Um, I think it's important that it is plans and that there are um, accountabilities around about that. Um, and that there is measurable outcomes in terms of the progress um, to achieving the aspirations of, of this bill. The government's view in terms of the bill at the moment, certainly, um, as it's laid out, was that uh, there should be a national plan and that uh, the effectively uh, each authority plan, if you like, would be a statement. And the statement would be how they would achieve the outcomes as laid out in the national plan, how they would drive forward their responsibilities towards the outcomes in a national plan. Is there a problem with that model or are there any issues with that model? I think the concern is the um, accountability um, and keeping the momentum going behind those local plans and you know how accountable the local plans are um, and people are to, to delivering against those. Um, I think what's going to be critical is the national plan and the national advisory group um, are very explicit in the responsibilities for reporting back. I think there's a danger that um, it becomes uh, an exercise where we don't see um, progress. It needs, to, it needs to have some momentum behind it. It needs to have some accountability in terms of deliverables. I'm trying to understand, let me probe this just a little bit more and understand why you feel, you're obviously expressing concern about a statement yeah. as opposed to a plan. And I'm trying to understand why you think that a statement would be worse than a plan. A statement would be a tick box exercise, but a plan wouldn't be a tick box exercise because mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. could equally be a tick box exercise if you want to make it like that. And surely if a, um, a local body has to publish a statement detailing how it will achieve the outcomes um, in the national plan, as long as the national plan has, the, has that detail in it, surely a statement from that local authority, for example, saying this is how we intend to do this, how do we intend to achieve or how we intend to make progress towards the outcomes in the national plan, um, that's not a tick box exercise, but in fact it's actually quite a focused way of achieving the outcomes as laid out in the national plan. Yes, I mean, I think, I think providing it, it's about report, there, there is a reporting mechanism back and there is a sense that um, within that statement there's intent and, and action that can be measurable um, and that people can see a tangible um, improvement. I think that's the critical part. Uh, I think there's been a number of examples where there has been statements um, but no intent and no movement behind them. So I think the important factor being that um, there's actually the intent in terms of how um, the local plans would be delivered is really important and the role um, of the National Advisory um, Council or Committee or whatever it is that's created uh, in having some kind of uh, accountability and monitoring of that. So can I just, just so we're absolutely clear on this point that what, and I'll come to other members of the panel in, in one moment, that it, the, the important point is the principle, if you like, here is that you have the, um, the intent and the monitoring and the progress and the publish, publication of outcomes. It's all of that kind of detail that you're concerned about. And it, whether it's a statement or whether it's a plan is, in a sense, slightly less important. It's the fact that it has to have... Yes, there's some solidity behind it, yes, effectively, yes, and accountability. Absolutely. And I think, I think having uh, the national task group uh, is critical to that and having the momentum behind that as well, so that there's accountability. OK, thank you. I, I, I believe Frankie and I think Avril as well wanted to contribute here. Frank, Frankie and then Avril. Yeah. Well, I think the key to success of this bill um, is... Uh, that public bodies should really think about, consider what the issues are for them, for the services that they offer. Um, and these will be individual to the different listed authorities. 
um, they really need to, to carefully consider what is involved for them. They will have the national plan um, and they can think about how they can achieve those uh, issues off the national plan, but that won't, uh, in a statement, indicate that they're kind of really exploring the issues as they um, uh, experience them in their particular field. Um, and I think it's really important that each authority really considers very carefully about their particular circumstance and what is required in that situation. So it's got to be contextually relevant. It's not about ticking the boxes off the national plan. That can work to a certain extent, but I think it will be far more effective if they have individual authority plans. I think the, the local authorities' plans should be really focused around action points, you know, whereas, I mean, the national uh, plan will obviously make what we hope are statements of intent, which have some sort of force behind them, because uh, so that the public authorities understand that they need to do these needs analysis and follow what's uh, outlined in the statement of intent. Um, the British Deaf Association has our BSL charter, um, which already mentions a great deal of those things. Pages 24 to 26 um, cover a, a pretty, pretty similar content, con content and context about a statement of intent that encourages police authorities, councils, uh, health authorities to sign up uh, and support, uh, make a pledge, if you like. Um, uh, there, are, there are five central pledges within the Charter, as an example, to work together um, in this strategic way to make sure that the, the needs of the community are covered. So. Um, when we talk about a statement, we really want to see a statement of intent. And those second two, those two, well, the last word, intent, is the most important one, I feel, because it actually strengthens the statement and takes something that exists in philosophy and puts it into practice. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Gordon. <coughs> um, we've just heard how important it is to have uh, plans in place. Uh, however, um, we heard from some of the, the written evidence that information what should be included in a BSL plan is currently quite vague. And we've also heard from COSLA that there was a lack of clarity. Um, so what are the panel's view on what should be included in both national and authority plans in order that they can be effective? Yes, Alvo. I think there's five key areas that I could summarise these into. I think the Facebook comments have highlighted this as well as the other evidence. The area of education is key. Following, following that, health. Social care, um, particularly um, for uh, elderly deaf people suffering from dementia and other conditions, that's a, a, an identified gap in services. Uh, to promote leisure, cultural, artistic um, inclusion of deaf people is a fourth. And the fifth area that is equally important is employment. So to go back to education, we've, we've mentioned this issue before, deaf children's access to their own education in their own language so that they acquire a holistic uh, well-being that, that gives them a sound foundation for their future. We, we've talked about um, interpreters uh, in uh, health services, but we have growing mental health issues and we don't have counsellors that are competent. Um, the em employment opportunities for deaf people, y y you know, as, as you, I'm sure you appreciate, uh, are, are woefully inadequate and, and behind the general population. So I think those are the, the five key areas that I would like to highlight. I totally agree with what Avril's just said. I just like uh, to add in there early years and uh, early intervention. Um, so support for families who have deaf babies, making sure that they get the right support in those early years um, to facilitate kind of growth, development and healthy lives thereafter. Sorry, Heather, yes. Can I just reinforce that point about the early years? Um, 
you know, and family sign, for example. We don't, uh, in Scotland, have a national programme for family sign, which is really um, vital in terms of really supporting that those 90% of uh, parents who uh, are hearing who have a deaf child and really promote a means of, of communication in the early years. We know how significant and important the early years are. Um, so just to really reinforce that point about early years being critical um, in the plans in terms of action. Thank you very much. Uh, just, just one quick, quick one. Okay. Um, You've mentioned five or six key areas that you feel should be included in national and authority plans, but should there be more detail on the content of plans included in the bill? Well, of course, we would love to see a lot more detail, a lot more flesh on the bones, but as you've already said, you know, the, you, maybe not in the face of the bill. I mean, we're, we're, this is more belonging in the national plan, providing that link between the legislation and the practice, like we've said. I mean, I mean, adding in early intervention, as Frankie said, would give us six key areas. And as long as uh, there was a clear link between those areas and, and a, a prioritization, um, I mean, obviously, we have to think of this as a, a long-term iterative um, process, you know, the world changes, new issues will come up, and uh, we need to be flexible and, uh, and adaptable. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, George. Thank you, Convener. I would like to ask about the performance review that's proposed. The bill proposes that each parliamentary session, the Scottish ministers should undertake a performance review and that provides an account of measures taken and outcomes attained. Now, uh, I've read the British Deaf Association Scotland's. Uh, uh, evidence and it says if there is a performance review chosen uh, evaluation approach it should not be a simple tick box exercise it should be both formative and summative evaluation component but when you talk to COSLA, COSLA then have come back and saying local authorities having to report uh, to the Scottish Government on this it could be quite difficult and uh, they actually don't like that. They think it should possibly go down the idea of community planning partnerships. Now what do we think? How could we, if we went down the COSLA route of the community planning uh, partnerships, how could we get a national picture of where things lie with the reviews and the outcomes in BSL? Okay. That's a good question. Um, if you have a wide performance review um, that, that focuses on two areas, I mean, you've talked about the difference between formative, you know, regular. Uh, iterative reviews that can provide quick fixes and solutions to issues identified and a summative assessment that takes a longer view on achievements and improvements. But I think you're quite right. What It's, it's important that, that the review comes from the community itself. Um, and you need that local, you need to tap into that local knowledge about what's happening on the ground. So the performance review, the answer is both. The, the local performance reviews should feed into a national picture. To, to give you perhaps an example, you know, the BDA, we have a project, uh, a participation project um, that we're working on now where we consult and review our services to the community. And that could provide a model um, for how this may work between uh, uh, authorities and councils and and the larger context um, so we uh, to resp you know the, the cause of the response has said that they want you know that this done on a local basis and of course we, we would put an and in there not an or this is very important that, that we get those local contributions so we understand what's happening but that it, it it feeds in and gives us a national picture so if I'm getting uh, if I'm saying this correctly Avril then possibly you're saying that we, we do have to stick with the idea of a national plan, uh, the national review, but uh, obviously feed in at the uh, community planning level as well. Yes, that's correct. I, I, you know, I think that you, you would look at both of them. I mean, the, the, the local stuff would be very much the everyday access, what's, what's going on on the ground, you know, and, and for that to be regular um, would make it effective. So and that's the community partnership model that you talk about, um, where we've got this collaborative uh, data collection, if you like, that, that provides for those reviews. It's mentioned is that if, a, if an authority isn't uh, get, uh, actually performing in the, correctly for with the, the national picture. The idea they're talking about is of naming and shaming authorities. Now, do you think this is enough 
or do you think there would have to be more to deal with the, the whole situation? If there was, if the national picture came back and said there was areas that weren't actually delivering. Thank you. I think that's a tough question, actually, um, because, yes, I think uh, sanctions might make people more proactive, um, uh, but it might also lead to, to them setting very insubstantial targets in the first place. Um, you know, um, because if, if they're worried about sanctions, then they'll just kind of make things easier to achieve. Um, so I think that it's a kind of balancing act, maybe, um, I think that's something that will need to be incorporated into the reviewing process. I think, I think it would be good for authorities to be allowed to aim high and fail, um, but be supported in that. If they continue, continually fail, then that's when sanctions might need to be brought in. But I think, you know, um, it's a bit of a carrot and stick act at the moment, I think, you know. Uh, I, I think you need to sort of, you know, tread sort of quite gently uh, to begin with, maybe. The like, naming and shaming is, that's probably, that, that's the only sanction there is. So that's probably uh, eventually, if things continually go down a route of non-compliance. Uh, yeah, yes, I think so. I think that maybe, if you could somehow look at, as Frankie said, you know, how often failure happens and what support has been given, though, when, when, when inadequacies have been identified. And so the, 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 there's a, there's, the focus is on resolving. Um, at, you're looking at a positive way forward when issues are identified. And only, I think, when, when a clear, uh, you know, authorities are clearly ignoring uh, or, or disregarding those um, could there be... Uh, some sort of sanction, but in terms of the bill itself, being a promotional bill and whether it's got the strength to do that, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But I, I think the, the, the key is that we've got to be supportive in, in the first, second, third, and you know, so many instances, because you know, ultimately, you know, like you say, san sanctions will be limited, so it would have to be seen as a last resort. Alan. I mean, we could also look at the best best practice model, a best performance model. So authorities or organizations that are not doing so well can look to those that are succeeding. That's very much a, a constructive, collaborative way of celebrating success and using that as, as uh, blueprints for how other uh, authorities and organizations can improve. Um, we're really struggling for time, Frankie, so you need to be very quick. I think uh, examples of good practice exist currently. Um, but what we'd like is some consistency across the nation. Um, and I don't think it would be difficult to model um, and share those examples of good practice. Um, Avril, if you just talk, I've, I've got a question which is, follows on from what Frankie's just said, just to finish off today. And it's really, so you can maybe come in on this. Um, the Scottish Government has actually suggested that um, a B, the BSL National Advisory Group could undertake collective consultation on authority plans. Um, now, this is, I think, to avoid um, local groups or small groups being swamped by requests to undertake reviews of local plans. I just wonder what your view was of a, a collective consultation process uh, driven from the centre, if you like, rather than um, more localised consultation um, by lots of different groups, with the danger, of course, of certain groups being swamped with requests for reviews, etc. Alan. Well, local consultation is good, but I mean, you, what you have got to consider, you know, there's how many authorities, and you know, and, and there is the potential of people being over surveyed um, and uh, things being missed. But you know, this collective consultation, you know, certainly has uh, some advantages, perhaps picking up uh, and picking up the gaps. But it, you know, I think rather than either or, it's an and situation. But yeah, the collective uh, consultation seems, in theory, like a good idea. Avril. Uh, 
I mean, what, first of all, we'd like to say is, you know, like the Facebook initiative that the Scottish Parliament took is an excellent example of being open and outward facing, being consultative in a very cost effective way. You'd have to say, I mean, you, you know how many contributions you've had. So we'd like to congratulate you on that and say this should be an ongoing part of a consultation process with the deaf community. Local consultations can, of course, happen, but um, rather than making them too onerous, um, what we can do is what you can do is tap into the expertise of organizations such as the British Deaf Association. We've, alre we've already got our participation survey going on. We're doing this outreach work in the community. There's, work, there's evidence and work available that can feed into the process. There isn't a need to reinvent the wheel constantly. And there are really good cost-effective ways for, for the government to uh, basically uh, leverage the expertise from our organizations and from technology such as Facebook so that we do allow that vital local knowledge to be fed up into, uh, fed up into these plans. And, you know, it, it doesn't need to be expensive. It doesn't need to be time-consuming or onerous. Um, if we're strategic about it, I think we can have our cake and eat it. One, one final question, which I want to just, it should be a very quick yes or no answer, really. But um, the, the, the timescale suggested by the bill, and I, want to, I think this is complicated, so I want, to, I want to read it out properly. The bill proposes that the national plan should be produced no later than six months after the start of each parliamentary session, and that authority plans should be published no later than six months after the national plan, but for the first set of plans, the relevant period should be 12 months. That, to me, is a complicated way to do it. And I think the government agrees. Um, uh, they've suggested a five or a seven year um, cycle for plans, which uh, is more in line with the Gaelic Language Act. And I just wondered what your view on that was. Heather? I would agree that it just sounds very complicated. I think if we've got something that works for Gaelic, then we should be adopting that for BSL. OK, thank you. And the rest of the panel agree with that? Yeah. If it works, uh, use it. Okay. Avril, did you? Uh, mm, it's not a yes or no answer, I'm afraid, <laughs> um, but I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. I mean, we'd like to see, you know, very much, you know, as much achieved in, in, in you know, in the first session as, as possible, I suppose, but I mean, in ter <laughs> because, I mean, you know, five or seven year plans, you know, our concern, of course, is that when you think of the education of deaf children, this is five or seven years in their lives. So all their opportunities are lost over a long time period like that. So it very much depends on which part of the strategy and the service provision we're looking at. Okay, that's very helpful. Can I? We've gone a little bit over time, I should say, but um, that's been very informative and very welcome. Can I thank you all for your contributions this morning? Um, I think the committee got a lot out of uh, the, this, this first panel session, so thank you very, very much. I'm going to suspend now for five minutes to allow us to change over witnesses. Thank you.
Okay. I mean, I think if, if you talk about being a vulnerable group, I would suggest that that's because that we're not listening to what the community want. And so we define what is best for the community rather than, than hearing what they're telling us is best for them. Um, we heard in evidence, and we've seen in written submissions and uh, in the Facebook submissions, that the Equality Act, the Human Rights Act, isn't standing up at the minute. Particularly in the health service has been the examples, but we're given other examples um, this morning. But in the health service where provision should be made, and, and obviously you, you spoke about the Human Rights Framework and the Equality Act, but that isn't being implemented in the way it should be, and that a lot of people we've seen in written submissions have said you could implement that right, but you would have to go to lawyers, you would have to take it from a formal process, and frankly, they're not enabled to do so with the barriers that are, they're already facing. Therefore, do not see this bill as the promoting language would help with the Equality Act and Human Rights Act and act um, with that rather than against that and be an add-on to that? Generalisation to say that the needs of the um, profoundly deaf communities are not being addressed by NHS in Scotland generally. I think you have to look. Well, I think you have to look. But, at, at sorry, work. sorry. It, you added generally to what I said. Therefore, that's a problem where okay, we go. Well, so, okay, so, in, in, so it would be absolutely if I'd said that, but that's not what I said. Okay, I, I stand corrected. Um, it is important to look at what public bodies are doing at an individual level. Some public bodies are exemplary in their provision, perhaps others are less so. Um, in Grampian, we take advice from the local deaf communities. We have involvement events. The agenda that we set is their agenda. We're not imposing an agenda, we are asking what can we do to make our services more accessible to you? What will make life simpler? And that is the, the agenda that we are following. The question was, so you didn't address that, do you think the BSL bill will add to the Quality Act and Human Rights Framework? Yes, I think it would. Okay, but there are other question. options as well. I understand that, but that was my question. Katie? I, just add, I think it's concerning about the examples of, of people experiencing poor access to NHS services. And, um, you know, we would hope that that is not the case throughout, throughout Scotland. And, and unfortunately, there have been cases where that, that has happened. Um, I suppose in our thinking, um, it's can we, can we make sure that public bodies, including the NHS, um, is um, following the Equality Act requirements um, better? Um, to make sure that the needs of BSL users are being addressed um, and could, could, should we focus more on that rather than um, developing new plans around around BSL but I suppose we're um, our position is is, is that we are um, we'd like to see the Equality Act and the Human Rights Act being, being used better by by public bodies and we're not just not sure whether the, the the requirement to do a, a, an additional plan would um, would strengthen that or, or not. Um, in terms of NHS Health Scotland, we're a national board and we provide a lot of information, health information. Um, we have recently been reviewing our inclusive communications policy and I've been doing a health inequalities impact assessment on that policy and we constantly review that, the requests that we get for, for BSL translations and, and hope to be responsive to that and that's something that we keep under review and I've listened with interest this morning to the, the panel discussion and certainly we'll, we'll feed that back both to our own organisation and to the broader NHS Equality and Diversity Network. Just what you were saying and I, I, it doesn't seem an unreasonable proposition. I don't think any of us are, are in the business of wanting to legislate simply for the, 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 the sake of it but as, as Siobhan was indicating there, we've got an Equality Act from 2010, a DDA from 2005, and a, a, and a human rights framework that's been in existence for as long as this parliament. And while there are undoubtedly exemplars in the health service, in education, in, 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 in a range of public services across the country, clearly the message is that that's patchy. And, and I think that what, what we're getting back from um, the, 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 the deaf community is a frustration that despite 
these legislative levers, which, let's face it, face it are significantly more um, substantive than, than this bill. But despite that, we're seeing this patchiness. And, and that what this bill perhaps offers an opportunity to do is identify and, 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 and symbolise the importance that we attach to BSL and that then those levers through the Equality uh, Act, through the, the Human Rights Framework, we can start to see um, a more um, consistent uh, approach to improving access for, for the, the deaf and, and hard of hearing community. Is that not an unreasonable, uh, or is that not a reasonable um, proposition to, for them to make? I, I don't think it's, it's unreasonable and, uh, and, and welcome the opportunity to have, you know, the, to hear the arguments and the discussion around that. I think it would just be, uh, we would want to flag up a concern if we've got existing legislation which um, covers some of these issues in terms of equity of access to NHS services and that's currently not working. Um, would additional legislation focused particularly around BSL, um, would that work in practice as well? Um, the challenge for us mm -hmm. has been almost to manage expectations in that, that um, what this bill mm -hmm. will do but what it won't do, I think, is, is something that we've been wrestling mm -hmm. with. But I think through the evidence we've taken so far, it would, it would appear that the levers for making progress here aren't through the delivery of plans, but that gives mm -hmm. it a status that can okay. then be enforced by um, praying in aid the Equality Act, the Human Rights Framework and, 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 and DDA. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, very eloquently expounding is perhaps highlighting an enforcement and monitoring issue um, in that I would agree there is inconsistency um, and there is a need to ensure consistency and to enforce the regulations and the, the law and legislation which is already in place and I would agree that perhaps um, yes uh, the BSL bill would give a much higher profile to, to the role of BSL, um, but there would still need to be some uh, stepping up of regulatory mechanisms. Otherwise, the BSL bill could be brought in as the BSL Act, but not take the, the uh, debate and the needs of meeting the needs of um, the profoundly deaf communities any further forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Colin. I'd like to ask the panel really the same question I asked uh, the previous panel. Some of the people giving evidence, some of the groups giving evidence uh, indicated a concern that the bill would use up scarce resources and indeed Cosler um, stated there's a risk that it would become an expensive bureaucratic exercise. We're, we're using resources here on developing plans. Is that the best use of resources or could these re same resources be used to better support BSL users. I, mean, I, I can start and other people can um, come in if, uh, as they wish. I think what you heard from the first panel was clearly a desire for more services, for um, more support, either translation services or direct support and access for, um, for BSL users. I think what the bill does is create um, a mechanism for establishing plans. What it doesn't do is create a mechanism for establishing additional services for, for, um, for people. And I think that's, that's an issue as we see it. Clearly, as uh, Mr MacArthur was outlining, there's a need for managing expectation about what this bill actually does. And there's a, there's a balancing, act, uh, balancing act there. But our concern is that if you look at certainly the, the financial memorandum, <coughs> Um, and the spice briefing, the, the upper end of the, the cost, and I, I, I granted that's for, the, for everything in there is about six million pounds. That's not an insubstantial amount of money, and whether that would be better spent in other ways to inv actually invest, <coughs> sorry, invest in frontline front line services. So it's clearly there's a concern for us. Um, Yes, there's maybe a need for um, pr promotion and, and giving uh, BSL a, a status that perhaps it hasn't had in the, in, in the past, but that doesn't in itself necessarily lead to the, to the actual services that would make people's lives different. So, uh, Colin, James has got a supplementary. Do you mean, are you still? Uh, I've got more to ask, but yes, if James wants to point. Okay, James. Uh, uh, just uh, regarding Mr Nicholls' comments there, I, I thought it was pretty clear from the first panel that they thought that the bill was a very, very strong symbol uh, uh, about how to move forward with BSL. You're right that everybody 
would like more resources for different services, and they did make that point. But nobody at any point said that they thought that that money should be better spent with more, more, on more services than they did on the bill. Well, I suppose what, what we are outlining is the fact is that um, is the money that's been invested in this bill truly the best way of getting money for 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 um, for communities and BSL users? And I suppose all we're outlining is as, as an alternative as, a, as an alternative question. The you, point I'm making is that the panel said that they felt it was. Well, I don't want to put words in the mouth of the panel members, but but you asked us a question. You asked Causer a question as to whether we think and that you referred to the panel. Yes, and I, but they also talked about um, the services that they would, you would have to spend money on translation services. The bill does not drive our translation services. The bill allows plans to be developed. If you are saying that translation services are what you would want to invest your money in, then clearly that's not covered by the bill. Can I just jump in here and make a point? The Gaelic language, much of the criticism of the BSL bill, um, I think probably is repeating the criticism that was made of the Gaelic language bill when it was first proposed. Um, yet we have seen now the National Gaelic Language Plan in place. We've, I mean, I see even in my local train station that Gaelic language signs have appeared. There seems to have been exactly what was predicted, a change in the mood and the attitude towards Gaelic. So people think about it more and they think about what they should do in terms of when they're changing signage or when they're doing other things or when they're producing material to think about Gaelic now. Isn't really that's what we're talking about here? The, the evidence about what the BSL bill, if it came, became an act, would do is, is exactly what has begun to happen with Gaelic. I think that's an, that's an entirely um, appropriate um, thing and we're not arguing for the promotional aspects um, um, of that. I suppose all we're saying at a time of scarce resources you have to be absolutely certain that that is indeed what you want to um, you want to do, and I think there is a there is a counterpoint to that. Um, and all we are doing is to, to make that make that point clearly. It's for the, the committee to make a judgment and a balance on all, on all these issues. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Colin. Uh, just moving on from that one. Um, what does the panel understand by the term promotion of BSL? What specific things should that entail? A basic is to ensure that we have in all areas of Scotland sufficient numbers of properly qualified BSL interpreters. Now, speaking for the, the northeast of Scotland, NHS Orkney has one qualified BSL interpreter. In Grampian, we have four, one of whom has been uh, not available to us due to maternity leave. Now, There are occasions, maybe every five or six weeks, when we have to rearrange uh, an outpatient appointment um, simply because a deaf person wishes to attend, but we don't have a BSL interpreter available to us. Um, a concern of my colleagues and members of the deaf communities in Grampian is that we do not have sufficient BSL interpreters. And Isn't that more about providing a service as opposed to promoting BSL? It is important to promote BSL, but you need to have BSL interpreters available. You can promote a service, but if you don't have the wherewithal to meet the, the, the demand from that service, it, it's a very serious issue. So it's a case of promoting, yes, but also ensuring that you have the sufficient BSL interpreters, the resources available to meet demand. And at the moment, there are issues there. I would probably just add around the promoting it, um, listen, having listened to the committee, uh, the, the panel earlier this, this morning, it's about promoting BSL as a, as a language in its own, own right. And that's certainly something at Health Scotland that we would be doing anyway as part of our work in terms of promoting inclusive communications around the publications that, that we produce. So um, when we review our policy around that, ensuring that BSL and our staff are aware that BSL is a, is a, a language and that they are sufficiently trained in understanding around that. And I think um, without wanting to speak on behalf of other NHS boards, I think in terms of staff training, that's something that, that, that they would do in terms of promoting BSL as a, as a language. Just moving on from... Sorry, the, sorry. 
we have to interrupt you again. I think Gordon's got a very Can small supplementary on this point. Yeah. I, I get the impression, rightly or wrongly, there's a wee bit of resistance to any more legislation coming through. So what I'd be keen to understand, given the views of, of the first panel, is what action is your organisation currently taking to promote BSL and how effective is that current promotion? I, I can speak for our local area rather than the, the, the national picture. Um, we promote BSL web clips on the Falkirk Council website. So if there are particular things happening in the council, and it wouldn't be only on social work or health, um, or social work or education, it would be across the council business. We, we would have a, a web clip. It might be that the bin times are changing or the colours are changing or new bins are being issued, but those basic information, which is quite important. We offer translation slots. I know that um, in the previous panel, they talked about letters and no, not being able to have them um, interpreted into their language. We have an afternoon a week where people can come and bring letters and have them um, trans explained. And I suppose at a, a more national level, we, we have locally um, online interpreting but um, the Scottish Government are rolling their NHS 24 pilot of online interpreting. That's being rolled out to all public bodies from the 22nd of March. Um, so that's something that, that will actually promote access to BSL to all, all of our service users. Closely with uh, North East Sensory Services, we work closely with Aberdeen Action on Disability, we have involvement events. We do everything possible to make it clear to members of the different deaf communities that BSL interpretation is available. Um, and I think that that's very important. Within our own staff, we do introduction to BSL training every year. And we have staff who've gone to level one and level two, not to replace the professional BSL interpreters, but to act as communicators, people who can greet uh, members of the deaf communities when they come to, to outpatient clinics and help to give reassurance and, and support. Um, I think that um, in Grampian and certainly on Orkney as well, our local deaf communities are, are aware of the availability of BSL interpretation services um, and we make them freely available. Harriet Watt offers BSL degree now and we also offer, we have students studying with us at both masters and PhD level. Um, we encourage people to uh, apply for courses and they will be ensure they will be supported um, and we will be looking to further look at access to services, how easily students can access services. Okay, thank you. From the panel that uh, promotion of BSL is somewhat dependent on availability of BSL interpreters and that the, certainly the interpretation of the word promotion really is about access to services and additional services is, is, that, is that how the panel sees it? Making sure that members of the local deaf communities are aware that BSL, BSL interpreters are readily available when accessing healthcare. Um, and making sure that all members of the communities know that it's available to them. It is provided by NHS Grampian and NHS Orkney and it's there and it's readily available. And that is not a cash limited budget. Whatever we need to spend to ensure that when healthcare is provided, members of the deaf communities have effective two-way communication, that is what we provide. Is that interpretation of promoting? Well, uh, I would be happy to, to hear what you would suggest as an alternative to, to that uh, definition. Happy to hear what the panel thinks about promoting. 
text promotion, as the, the, the promotion that, that was talked about earlier around about Gaelic language and, and trying to build public awareness and knowledge about um, BSL as a, as a language. And I think that that goes on top of this sort of how do you access local services, what's available to you that's been sort of outlined um, already. So there's a two aspects of that. Now, perhaps the bill might help with the, the first one, which is the, the public awareness of the language. I think we, we've We've put a note of caution is around what it does to signpost towards um, um, services and raising expectations about additional services that might follow on from that from that local promotion. So you've got the two aspects of it there, and we can clearly see there's a, there's there's a there's a, a, a it could be helpful for one, and it could even be helpful for the other, but only if you manage expectations about what you're actually going to be delivering in terms of local services. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, James. Thank you, Convener. Uh, there's been a number of comments uh, suggested there could be some unintended consequences for other languages or forms of communication used by the deaf community, mainly a, a, around a detrimental effect on the available resources to support people with other communications needs. Do you have a view on whether these other forms of communication used by deaf people could be negatively affected by the BSL bill and in what ways? In our area, we have a contract and it's across communication support. So the, the contract we have is for 10 hours of interpreting and that would cover BSL, hands-on signing, deafblind manual, lip speaking, note taking. If, I, I suppose one of the concerns I, I would have is if we have to then take BSL out of that or that's dealt with differently, we may, the economies of scale may not be as is, and it could become more costly for us rather than less costly. That was a possibility for the bill that, that, that it had to be separated. Would it not just be that you would have to monitor what you were? I suppose that's for me the bit that's not totally clear in the bill because the bill is very, very clear that it's BSL and yeah, it's yeah, about absolutely. BSL and, and so I'm not clear about what that will mean for those those other um, the, the, the other communication support needs of, of which we have many and certainly in terms of our population um, you know th there would be a greater majority in, in the other group requiring um, you know the sort of note taking um, support or, or communication aids um, which would be so, Sorry, can I just clarify that then? Are you saying that the, the, the BSL plays a, a minority role in, in terms of the services that you give? Because the, the panel, um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the suggestion from the panel was that the BSL was the, the largest part of, of those services. Uh, the service that I manage is across sensory uh -huh. impairment, so within that BSL, <clears throat> the numbers would be the smallest. The percentage of time allocated would be higher, but the numbers of the population would be lower because it's across sensory impairment. Okay, thank you for that. Does anybody else got any comments? We have similar concerns. At the moment, we're probably in the unique position that we have access to funding called Disabled Students Allowance, and that provides any support that uh, a deaf student would need and includes note takers and things like equipment, video cameras, so it covers a range of support and just this focus on BSL alone uh, raises concerns for us in that area. So you would need some kind of security around the fact that that the resources weren't going to be diverted from the other yeah. services? Yes. I mean these resources are directed at the individual it's their money, it's their funding, and they can use it in the best way, you know, for their own communication. Uh, we would meet with a disabled student early on, a deaf student early on, find out exactly what their needs are, and then we can apply that funding to cover all of their needs, not just BSL. Okay. Does anybody else have any comments? It's obviously very, very important. Um, for people with acquired profound hearing loss, um, lip reading is also very important. Um, and in terms of using BSL, um, especially amongst the, the younger users of BSL, um, the 3G and 4G mobile phone technology is very important because I have seen uh, on a regular basis younger BSL users holding the phone and Skyping or FaceTiming 
and signing to each other. And it was suggested uh, that I put forward the idea that perhaps some Scottish Government support for um, members of deaf communities who wanted to use these facilities, perhaps some financial support toward smartphones, androids, to, to make sure that these uh, tools, which can be quite expensive, are readily available. Mm. Okay. C can I, I just take you on? Sorry, there's no other for further comments on that. Right. C can I just take you on to uh, another question about uh, the, whether the bill should include specific reference to the needs of deaf, blind, BSL users, and if so, in what way? There's a, a wide variation and certainly the, the last panel said that people who are deaf blind come from um, a BSL background. Um, my experience is that many of them are visually impaired first and blind and then become deaf and so their first language would be English um, and therefore um, I think care would need to be taken and it would need to be spelled out as to what part of, of of the deaf blind community you were referring to. Don't see it as being a straight, straight Not straightforward. Straight no. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? We have no deaf blind communicator in Grampian. We had one deaf blind communicator um, who has retired and made it clear that they no longer wish to provide services. So when we require a deaf blind communicator, we have to bring them up from the central belt which obviously involves a great deal of, of planning. Need for some kind of move on yes. highlighting the importance of deaf blind communicators. Absolutely, and a need for additional training. And possibly through this bill? Through this bill or whatever other mechanism the committee considered appropriate. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just on that point, Mr Firth, if, if that is the case and obviously you have to go out with the health board, then how are you meeting the needs through the DDA and Equality Act as you spoke of in the first question? By bringing up a deafblind communicator from the central belt. How long does that take for the user and their appointment in the health service and if it's it, it can an emergency? It, it can take several days. Uh -huh. to be, it depends on the availability of the deafblind communicator. So, the point is, if it's an emergency, if you're in, in a health situation, as you can imagine, and everyone's stressed, having to wait several days for an interpreter... No, can I say, no, nobody makes... waits days for emergency treatment, with respect. Um, so, so you would just go without the interpreter in that case, then? In those circumstances, um, it would be a clinical decision, obviously, but in those circumstances, there can be assistance from family members. But our preferred option, if there is time and it is, uh, you know, circumstances dictate, our preferred option is to bring a deafblind communicator to Grampian. Okay. Doesn't, doesn't this just highlight the problem with the equality of access that we've heard from the first panel and from many who have contributed to the committee's work so far on this bill? it highlights is a need for, I, I personally would like to see um, the degree courses which operate to train BSL interpreters. I would like to see them fully funded and I would like to see the uh, individuals undertaking these courses salaried during the course of their training. Um, in, in the same way that, that, that um, nurses in training are salaried and then perhaps once they had uh, completed their training, a guaranteed minimum income for three years, because most tend to be self-employed, a guaranteed minimum level of income for three years. We need to get more people coming forward to be trained as BSL interpreters. We need to have more people coming forward to be trained as deafblind communicators. Do you so therefore, are you saying to us that you currently have a, have a vacancy or vacancies for both interpreters in BSL and deafblind? No, we do not employ um, deafblind communicators. We do not employ BSL interpreters. Of the ones we access in Grampian, three are freelance and we have a service level agreement with them, each of the three individuals. The fourth person works for Northeast Sensory Services and we access them through North, Northeast Sensory Services. So there are four in Grampian and that's how we make sure we have access to those four. 
Okay, but on, on the deaf blind um, BSL interpreter, are you currently advertising, pursuing, trying to find somebody in the area? We have tried to, to find somebody. We know that the, that individual is not available, and that's why we bring someone up a deaf blind communicator from the no, central. Sorry, sorry, maybe my question wasn't clear. I, I understand that the person that you've been using in the past is currently unavailable. I, I get that. Mm. Um, what are you doing to pursue a, a replacement for that person locally in the Grampian area? Right. There isn't a replacement in the Grampian area. Uh, we have asked all of the various agencies. We have uh, sought far and wide. There is no one in Grampian who can fulfill that role. There is nobody in the entire Grampian area who... Is a qualified and trained deaf-blind communicator. Okay, thank you. Um, Liam. Thank you. I just, um, before turning to the issue of uh, ministerial responsibilities, there's a comment, I think, made by um, Maria about um, the, the use of English and, and the development um, of uh, sight loss and, and, and then loss of hearing as well. And I think, um, Katie, you referred to publications that are, are, are produced and... Um, I think, Lillian, you were talking about note-taking support. It did strike me that we're talking about BSL as a, a, as a verbal language. What, what predominantly is the, the written um, uh, language of, of um, most users of, of, of BSL? In Scotland, is is, is it English? Is uh, what's well, BSL is is a visual language. It's not yeah. a written language. Yeah. Um, it in terms of service delivery, um, it, it, for us, it comes within the communication support. Um, and and just incidentally, following on from some of the difficulties that um, they have in Grampian in terms of getting deaf and blind communicators, our greatest difficulty in the the. Falkirk area would be to get um, lip speakers. There's a huge dearth of lip, lip speakers. Um, now that would be that those people would be coming from an English background, having having lost their hearing. But that that's a kind of area that there isn't a course in Scotland at the current time, and and that's an area that's much more difficult for us. Right. Okay. Um, moving on to the issue of ministerial responsibilities, obviously the bill talks about having a minister, um, a dedicated minister responsible for, mm. for, for BSL. The Scottish Government have, have expressed some anxieties around that, pointing to um, sort of collective responsibility, albeit that um, the, the, the responsibility for the national plan would fall within a particular portfolio and therefore under um, a, a specific minister. I'd just be interested in, in the panel's views about whether or not a, 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 a dedicated minister uh, would be a, a positive or a necessary um, requirement under the bill, and, and if so, what the responsibilities of that minister specifically ought to be beyond the development of the national plan. I don't think we've got a, a strong view on it. I can see government's point of view in terms of collective responsibility across portfolios. Um, we do at the moment have a minister with responsibility for languages, so it, there is a potential logical home for BSL within his portfolio, potentially. But, <clears throat> but we don't have a, a strong view as to whether there should be a, a, a clearly a, a, a responsibility um, given to one minister or, um, or not clearly. What goes in the national plan, I think there'll be probably some discussion on that later on, is, is of interest um, to us. But the actual ministerial responsibility, I think that's for, um, for government to decide, albeit we do have a, a language minister at the moment. I would, I would agree with that. I think we have a, a strong view on, on, that, on that position. The, the, the government's also proposed the idea of a, a national advisory uh, group or national advisory body um, made up, obviously, of ministers, uh, COSLA. Um, and also representatives of the, the, the deaf community. Uh, I think the latter have indicated I think, a general support for that, but, but stressed the importance of ensuring that the group uh, as a whole is a, a majority from uh, within the, the, the deaf community. Again, uh, are there any comments that you would make about the desirability, the effectiveness that uh, such a group could perform, and indeed the, the balance of membership? Um, sorry. <coughs> 
Um, I, I think the relationship between the, the advisory group and the national plan is, is, a, uh, is, is an important one. I mean, clearly, it would be helpful, I think, if, if we were ha are to have a national plan that, uh, that is developed in a, a consultative way that engages with uh, um, everybody involved um, within the, um, within the um, uh, BSL community, but also service providers as, as well. Um, our strong preference is to develop anything uh, um, in, a, in a joint basis and to do that as, as, a, as joined up a way as, as possible. So um, the actual membership of the, of the advisory the advisory group um, would clearly need to represent everyone who's involved. So it's potentially quite a large group. Um, so it's not without its challenges in terms of operation on that. But if you are to have a national plan, then at least there's a logic to actually having an advisory group to advise us um, on that, albeit we've got some um, some issues about what would be in the potentially in the national plan and how that might relate to, to local plans within the, the proposed legislation. Is there then a risk we need to be alive to that um, as you say, the group doesn't get so big as almost to be unmanageable. And is there, a, is there perhaps a case for saying you have a national advisory group that has um, uh, the, 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 the potential and the scope to assign bits of, of, of work uh, and, and input to, to others who may not necessarily sit on the group on a, on a standing basis? Is that a model that might work. That sort of model works well within um, government. It's a, uh, the sort of um, having a, a subgroup or whatever you'd want to call it. I mean, that's pretty tried and tested in terms of civil service practice. I don't think that's a, a, a difficult thing. But the, t just to be clear, there wouldn't be a resistance to the, the proposition from the, the BSL community that, that whatever the configuration and, and whatever the size, that actually they would have a majority as, as, as service users on that, uh, on that group. I, I mean, others can speak for themselves. I mean, clearly, I think we need to know what the exact remit of the group is and what it's actually there to do. Um, I think once you've got that, the membership would have to follow the function of the um, of the, the group. Clearly, it has to re be representative of, of all the interests around the, around the table, and I think we'd make a judgment on that once we've actually seen all the um, all the, 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 the detail. I don't think we can go further than that at this time. Yeah, although the, in, in a sense, those from service providers will all have um, sort of official titles and jobs functions that, that um, provide a persuasive case as to why they should be on the group. I suspect for service users, it, it may be a bit um, of a grayer area, and therefore, I don't, unless we accept the principle that actually there should be that, um, uh, it should be that inbuilt um, majority of service users, there is a, there is a risk that um, justification for, for membership is easier to be made on the service provider than the service user side. Is that... Is that a fair I, I, can, I can accept that line of lining argument. I suppose all I'm saying is it, there's a potentially large group of people to be around that table. There's a, there is a discussion to be had about the, the principle of, of, of that, and we don't have a strong um, position on whether there should be um, a majority of BSL users on the on the the committee or not, I think we, what we have a, a stronger view on is how potentially the national structures that might be set up, how that those might relate to local structures and what the, the through flow of information is um, between those. The actual group, national group, if it's to be set up, you would have to look at exactly what the function of that group would um, 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 would do. But your, li your, your lining reasoning, I, I would accept, um, but you'd need to look at everything in the round once you actually got the detail. Okay. Thank you. Um, you, you, I don't know whether you were in for the first panel, you may have heard, but I, I did ask them, um, and I'm going to ask you about the Scottish Government's view or suggestion that uh, listed authorities, um, instead of publishing plans, should publish a statement. Um, uh, their idea being that the statement would set out how each authority plan to make progress towards priorities identified in the national plan. I just wondered what the panel's view was of this question of a, a plan versus a statement. Um, provided it fulfilled the primary function, which would be to give BSL um, the appropriate recognition and provision that it requires across Scotland, across the, the, the bodies. It, it, it would be, I would suggest, for the committee to decide which would be the best option and that the vehicle might be the um, equality outcomes, which all uh, public bodies in Scotland were required to produce under the Equality Act 2010, Specific Duty Scotland Regulations 2012. And they are coming up for updating in April of this year. So there are a number of vehicles, but I would suggest it would be for the committee to decide which 
vehicle they consider to be most appropriate to take this forward. Okay. Yeah. I, th I think a, a statement could could be symbolic in the way that we that, that the BSL community want to see their their, their language recognised, um, and also it could set out what an authority plans to do to make sure it meets the needs of, of BSL users. Um, there's previous. Um, types of statements in, that public bodies have developed, such as an equal pay statement, which sets out what organisations are going to do to close the, the pay gap. So it could follow something like that, or it could be much more um, um, worked up in terms of a statement, which you know might actually have some outcomes attached attached to it. So I think there's various ways that that could work. Okay. Point of view, it's important what will be contained within the document, if you want to call it that. So I think it's important that whether it's a plan or a statement, what it is that we're actually um, um, we're actually saying that we are committing to, whether that's within a public statement or agreeing around a plan. I mean, a statement would suggest um, probably a, um, an intent to deliver something. A plan might suggest that there's something a little bit more detailed lying behind that. So the, the, the language may be as important, and I can understand why um, the previous speakers would err towards a plan rather than a statement. But really, the, the heart of the matter is what is it that's contained within it? And I think that's where our questions lie. Any comment on this, yeah, Probably guidance is needed on what would be contained uh, before you could decide whether a plan or a statement was the best way to go. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, Gordon. Yeah, just on, on that point of um, what should actually be contained within the plans, um, I'm going to ask the same questions that I, I asked in the earlier panel. Um, we've heard from the written evidence and Cosler themselves said that there was a lack of clarity around the expected content of the national plan and we heard from another uh, written submission that it was quite vague um, the first panel highlighted six key areas for them and they wanted specified a certain level of service and measurable outcomes. Uh, what I'm keen to understand uh, from the second panel is what do you think should be included in both national and the authority plans in order that the plans can be a, as effective as possible? That's, that's the fundamental question. I don't think that I would have an, arg an answer for that. If you look at what the previous panel talked about, education, health, social care, um, leisure, employment, in, in, in early years, all big areas, uh, you, you're talking probably the largest, um, you know, there's probably not many public services not covered by that. Um, the, the issue for us is what happens, what, what do you mean about take education an area that I know um, something uh, something about compared to the other areas, what additional services are being unlocked by the national plan or indeed the local plan for education that are not being delivered now and how would those be funded and how would those be resourced, not just in terms of actually money but staff time and being able to get um, suitably trained and qualified um, people. So it's really uh, the thing is, are we, is this a re-articulation of what's already out there, albeit with a, to some extent, a, a greater prioritisation and maybe um, um, promotion, or, or is this about unlocking new resources to go into new service delivery? And that's really the question for, for us. And if it's, a, if it's the latter one, I think that means that you're, you're looking at quite a different sort of um, 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 piece of legislation that would inevitably have to, 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 to have be um, further funding to, to allow it to be delivered. Properly. No, nobody else want to comment on that. No. no. Service that would be around the equity of access, which um, I would suggest is covered already through NHS boards' equality outcomes and their plans around um, interpretation uh, and communication support for for patients. Right. Um, there has been a suggestion that the preparation of plans and use that yourself, Mr. Nicol. Uh, will divert funds from other areas to support that currently support the BSL community. Is there an estimate of what the additional costs would be for your organisation? Have you calculated how much the potential additional costs would be? The only, the only work that we've done is effectively to look at the, 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 the financial memorandum, so we haven't done any additional um, costing. I suppose what we're, what we're saying is if, if you are 
Um, and it, it would appear to be that there's around about £6 million of additional costs. Um, government estimate that they spend around £2 million, or plan to spend £2 million already over 2016 um, 2020 in BSL. So that would be an additional cost of £4 million. There's a question as to whether that additional cost comes from, um, whether that's met within existing budgets or whether that's um, um, uh, funded by Scottish Government. If it's to be met within an existing budget, then that clearly would put pressure on something and you'd have to make a choice whether that comes from outside this, this, this sort of sensory impairment um, budget or whether it's within that would be, have to be a choice. It would have to be weighed up, but clearly there's a concern for us if, it, if there isn't additional funding and there is... Um, some additional um, uh, responsibilities to statutory to comply to, then that could um, divert resources from elsewhere. Anybody else still? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, George. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Uh, I've asked a similar question to the, the last panel, but the bill, obviously, about performance review, it's all about seeing how we actually best practice, share best practice, ensure that we deliver on uh, everything that uh, we're wanting to do. But the par each parliamentary session, the Scottish ministers should undertake a performance review of authority plans, and that includes an account of measures taken and outcomes attained. Now, many of the uh, organisations involved thought the performance review was a, mecha a good mechanism for holding public authorities account, but COSLA uh, actually felt that it was confused and was it confused the accountability relationships that exist within local government? Uh, Robert, can you tell me why? Can you explain that to me then? Local government is not accountable to Scottish government. I think that's the heart of um, the heart of this. But um, clearly, what what we're arguing about is if there, ha there is to be enhanced accountability for service delivery, that should be with local communities. And we heard a little bit of that this morning as, um, as well. Um, what we're not saying is that there isn't a, a need for um, potentially for national planning and cooperation nationally. Clearly, we have um, the ability to translate national priorities into what happens locally. We have single outcomes agreements and elsewhere. So there's, there's a, there, there are uh, mechanisms for um, translating national a national sense of direction into um, what happens locally. But I think what we are what we are concerned about is the language round about um, uh, performance review who is performing, re reviewing the local plans, who makes a judgment as to whether a plan is, is fit for purpose or not. We have a range of um, services covered potentially within this. Education is one of them. We already have scrutiny structures for, for education of which um, um, independent scrutiny is, is brought to bear on service delivery. We have other um, forms of performance uh, appraisal internally within authorities, um, as well as external um, through things, organisations like the care inspectorate and, and such like. So what additional things are we actually creating here for the specific purpose of this, um, of this piece, of, um, um, piece of legislation? So it, the question for us is, where is the most appropriate accountability to lie? I think arguably, if, the, if, if there is to be an enhanced accountability between um, BSL users, um, it should be at the local level um, and not necessarily um, 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 at, at the national level, albeit, as I've said, there are mechanisms that can be, to some extent, you can get the best of both worlds. The actual BSL performance review is the basis of which is for the Parliament to hold Scottish ministers to account and for ministers to hold listed authorities, of which local authorities would be one of them to account as well. So basically we're giving everyone the opportunity, the bill would give everyone the opportunity to the, the be open and democratic. I, I just uh, find it difficult. I haven't been a former councillor myself. I know how community planning uh, partnerships work. And one of the concerns that the British Deaf Association Scotland had was that they wanted to make sure that it was not just a simple box ticking exercise, that we actually shared, as they said earlier on today, shared best practice and would, how would we possibly, if we kept everything at a local level, how could we get a national uh, picture of how things were going? Because we're all accountable in this to, in order to make sure that we can uh, make this bill actually make a difference. There's a difference, in my, in my view, between getting a national picture and, and ensuring national um, uh, and ensuring a direct line of accountability for for delivery, and then making a judgment as to whether somebody's um, succeeded or not in terms of um, service delivery. Clearly, there are there are ways in which we can get a, a national picture about certain aspects of whatever strategy you 
you'd want to, to implement, and you can um, choose how to um, how to report on that. I think where our concern lies is this notion of um, performance uh, a, a, a performance appraisal, effectively, about how an, um, a national um, organisation such as Scottish Government would performance appraise a, a local organisation like local government for something that um, the local authority would have closest to the community, closest to the services that they deliver, and effectively you're almost getting in a second guessing situation as to who, who actually knows um, best. And that is a concern for us, and all we're doing is flagging up the fact that we see that that is a concern. Ken, one of the things that the British Deaf Association for Scotland says that this whole idea of a, a national performance review give a sense of collective shared mission to achieve the goals of the plans with the, the community it serves. Authorities would thus become accountable to the BSL community to ensure engagement, involvement, dialogue and continuous improvement. Is that not something we should all be kind of embracing when we're going down this route and uh, looking at ways to uh, break down the barriers so that we can all work to uh, deliver uh, this? for um, um, against um, enhanced local accountability so that local people, whether they're BSL users or other, um, or have, a, have a, another um, uh, sensory payment or something like that, can access services and then can have a genuine say about the services they offer and can have um, a, can play their part in their local processes. That's not, that's, we're not arguing for, um, for that. All we're arguing is it is it, um, is it we see a concern between um, the nature of the relationship between the national organisations, which Scottish Government is, is one of them, but the national body as well, that could be the national um, group that could be established, and how that relates to local decision making, um, and then who makes a judgment later on as to whether something something's happened that. Um, <clears throat> There's a feel, feeling that performance hasn't been as uh, as successful as, as we'd like, and then who makes a judgment on that, and then what happens after that? So that that's the, the concern we're flagging up. Robert, I'm I'm just trying to get my head around this because basically, even if when you heard the first panel earlier on today, they were even talking about the the limited sanctions that are in the bill are just effectively, you know, don't do it again kind of thing, do better, must do better. So. Uh, they were even talking about they wouldn't even go to that extent. We would try and find if there was an issue, find a, go into an area and try and work together to actually make sure it's working. So uh, is it not, is it, Robert, with the best will in the world, are we, are we not sh been a wee bit paranoid about the situation here? You know, it's I wouldn't say we're paranoid. All, all I'm saying is we are an organisation that represents local authorities. We are effectively um, stressing the importance of local accountability, where we think if there is to be a sanction, it should be a sanction by the local community on the local authority through, through the mechanisms that, uh, that, are, that already exist and could be established. I think we would have a big concern as to whether um, there is a sanction taken um, by a national organisation to impose that on a, on a, on a local authority um, and then making a judgment that that is indeed the, the correct thing to, to, to do. I mean, that's a very consistent thing for COSLA to, to, to argue. So it's not a, it, it doesn't necessarily apply to this and doesn't apply in other areas. It's, it's a consistent thing. Um, where, where, there, where there needs to be that real strong connection is at the local level between communities and those who service, um, deliver services on their behalf. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I've got a final question. Sorry, um, it's a different situation within health because health boards are already subject to very thorough annual reviews and the annual review process. I could see no um, possible reason why um, the needs of the local deaf communities through, and the BSL requirements could not become an integral part of that annual review process. In addition, as part of the review process, the Minister and team undertaking the review also meet with local people. So it would be quite possible to include uh, local um, BSL users in the formal meetings process so that um, the, the needs would be, could be assessed and whether they were being met. However, I wouldn't see that process as replacing the routine ongoing uh, involvement with the local deaf communities to, to find out how well services are being met and to ascertain their needs. Uh, I think that would continue, but the annual review would be a good opportunity for external scrutiny as to how well those needs are being met. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. 
do you have duties under the equality mainstreaming? So um, I wouldn't see a difficulty with expanding this to, to include um, what benefits we had brought into this area. So it could be covered under the current structure yeah. that you have in place? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thank you. I just got one final question, which is about the time scales. Um, obviously, the bill, I won't read it, read it again, but it's about every parliamentary session, six months after, but 12 months after the first one, etc. Um, what is your view on the time scales proposed in the bill for publication of the national plan? Robert? I, th I think our view was. Um, it was probably quite complex as it, as it was set out, and I think I think there's a there's an additional complexity of fitting in with with local elections and things like that as well, which are, are a, a slightly different um, time scale from parliamentary elections. So I think if there was a um, a way of simplifying that along the lines of I think you suggested through Gaelic language, then that'd be something we would want to we would want to um, um, look at. I accept the point that that, that was given about wanting. To see progress, and I can uh, and I can understand that, but it does seem quite complex the way it's outlined in the bill. Okay. Any other views on the time scale? No. Okay. Listen, can I thank you very much for coming along this morning? We appreciate you taking the time to be here with us um, and to help us examine the BSL uh, bill. Um, I'm going to suspend briefly so we can allow the next panel to come.
Can I welcome our final panel for this morning? Um, our third panel today is Carly Brownlee from the Scottish Association of Sign Language Interpreters, Clark Denmark, who is a BSL broadcaster and former academic, Professor Rob Dunbar, Chair of Celtic Languages, Literature, History and Antiquities at the University of Edinburgh, and Professor Graham Turner, Chair of Translation and Interpreting Studies at Harriet Watt University. Uh, welcome to you all this morning. Um, just for everybody's information, Professor Dunbar will be responding in Gaelic to committee questions. Simultaneous English interpretation will be provided through the headsets, which I assume everybody has around the table, uh, while BSL interpretation will also be provided. Can I say to anybody in the gallery who's going to use a headset for the, the Gaelic uh, to English translation that they should set their headphones to channel one, channel one for the, for the interpretation? Um, OK, if we're all ready, I'm just going to begin. So um, I'll start with Siobhan McMahon. Thank you. Um, the first question is whether legislation is necessary um, to promote BSL and what specific outcomes and improvements you consider the bill will deliver? Sorry, Professor Turner. Uh, just so that I'm only going to be signing for a couple of sentences. Um, I did want to let you know that I am a BSL user myself, um, but in respect to your first and preferred language being English, I will switch back to using English. Uh, sometimes the deaf community refers to people like me in a slightly light-hearted way of saying that we're hard of signing. <laughs> so out of uh, respect to both sides of that equation, uh, I'm going to switch from British Sign Language and go back to my first language, which is indeed English. Uh, so thank you for allowing me to do that, uh, and, and thanks for the question. Um, I, I mean, I think we've, we've perhaps heard enough already today uh, to know that uh, there is a pretty strong view that the existing legislation is, is not meeting uh, the, the, the uh, aspirations and the needs of the community. Um, I, I, mean, I would say, and did say in evidence, uh, in written evidence, that this isn't a new issue. Uh, this is a long-standing issue. Um, deaf community has been saying in the UK and in, indeed in other countries since at least 1880 uh, that access to education in sign language uh, is an absolute necessity for the community and that lots of other aspects of society follow from that. So the conference in 1880 that, uh, that banned the use of sign language in deaf education set a, set a tone for uh, social provision across the board. We've had disability legislation of many different kinds since the Second World War in particular. Uh, we've had understanding that British Sign Language uh, is a real and proper language since 19, the 1970s in the UK. <coughs> uh, and, and still here we are uh, discussing uh, the, the issues and, uh, the, and, the, and the problems that the community faces. Uh, and as colleagues have said already today, the Facebook uh, evidence from the community has shown very, very clearly uh, the, the, despite uh, some of the other evidence you've heard that provision is in place and the existing legislation can serve needs, etc., it isn't working. <coughs> and so um, something a little bit different uh, is required. So the bill, I think, uh, serves that purpose by adding a clarity of focus around British Sign Language as a language. It's not a disability issue. It's not a deaf communication issue. It's simply a linguistic minority issue. Uh, and the bill gives us, affords us the opportunity to um, deal with it in those kind of terms. <coughs> okay. Anybody else want to contribute to that? Yes, Clark. Just to add to what Graham has said, this has been a very long wait for the deaf community. Edinburgh should be very proud. The very first deaf school in the world was established here in 1760. So you think, well, hang on, 1760? That was when signing was used. British Sign Language is not a new modern phenomena, and the research bears this out. Um, they were educated, the children back then, in sign language, and with obviously with an aim to, to integrate into society in English as well. But the best way for deaf people to access English is through British Sign Language. So we have over 180 years of history here in this city. Um, this country has the potential to do this. The British, the BDD is, as it was then, with 150 year history, had two very clear aims, the production, the preservation of British Sign Language and also uh, the insistence of British Sign Language in the education. And there's been countless uh, maneuvers since then to change all of that.
Now, we don't have anything clear since 1889 about clear service provision in the area of education. Now, Graham mentioned the Milan Conference in 1880 banning sign language as one of its resolutions, and that's had a, a, a huge knock-on effect. The Royal Commission in Britain was very much swayed by those arguments, and that's led to so many of the problems that we see, not only in education, but what comes from education throughout deaf people's lives. You could almost take the, I mean, it's almost had the, the, the point of view of, of, of British Sign Language being, uh, you, you know, an inconvenience, and yet, despite all the barriers, the prejudice, and the oppression, it's shown itself to be a strong, vibrant language that survives, and it survives for a reason. There were members of that second panel that said, oh, we've got this provision and that provision. Like Graham said, it's clearly not working. The contributions of the first panel, I think, illustrate the failures, and I've got to congratulate the Scottish Parliament for at least opening this dialogue and taking the lead in the UK. The deaf community is delighted by this move. Thank you. Carly. I'd like to support both of those comments. And I'm here to represent SASLI, the Scottish Association of Sign Language Interpreters. And looking at the second panel, uh, they look, seem to look at us as a disability issue. We want to remove that view altogether. Really, BSL is a language, it's a culture, it's an identity, an expressive way of expressing ourselves for people who grow up deaf, and also for us to access information through the use of, of sign language. We don't rely on sound at all. We use a visual language. So this new law will encourage us to see, and see encourage all to see, and not BSL as a tool, but part of our lives, not an additional thing that's added on to our lives, it's part of us. And I think the bill will really help with that and take a lead on that. Thank you. I mean, as the panel have said, we did hear evidence in panel two that suggested that if we were only to implement the Equality Act or do a bit more in the human rights framework, that we would achieve the same outcomes as the primary legislation. Do you agree with that view? Um, and, and if not, why not? I mean, I, I think I think the um, uh, of course the the other legislation that has been talked about today is, is not about to disappear. It will still exist, uh, and so the, the the notion here is that the BSL bill will will work in in tandem with existing legislation and help to ensure that existing legislation maintains a clear focus on BSL alongside other issues that it deals with. Uh, I think earlier on today, we were talking about the numbers of BSL users, the numbers of lip, lip speakers required and so on. And, you know, there are, there are, as the census showed, 12,500 approximately BSL users within Scotland. But nobody in this room can tell you how many of those are deaf BSL users. Nobody knows. So we're starting from a very poor basis in terms of knowing uh, what, what provision is required for the BSL using community. In that context, it becomes very easy for the uh, requirements to, to, to support that community uh, to be backgrounded because we know about other communities. We know about the numbers of uh, uh, people with visual impairment. Uh, we know, for example, about the numbers of people who are using Makaton in Scotland and so on. Uh, British Sign Language users who are themselves deaf, those statistics are not available to anybody. Uh, so it, it's very, it becomes very easy uh, for the BSL issues to be clouded and lost and pushed to the back of the queue, in effect. <coughs> so the bill, as proposed, I think, uh, is, is very much designed to bring those to the foreground when appropriate, alongside the other issues which existing legislation should be able to handle. I just want to say a little to the views expressed. Firstly, thank you for the opportunity to come to this meeting and for the opportunity to use Gaelic as part of the evidence I'm giving. I agree that a bill and uh, an act based on the bill is essential from the point of view of the Gaelic users. The Gaelic Act has made a big difference with the development of policies connected to Gaelic, uh, highlighting, advancing the status of Gaelic and the understanding about Gaelic and 
the, the needs of the language and for users and speakers. I think users of uh, British Sign Language are very similar to the Gaelic community. As we've heard earlier, it's not a means of uh, conversation, it's about identity, it's about culture, a rich culture. It's to do with language that is just as precious as Gaelic, and because of that, Although there is existing legislation and the question of equality is important, there are needs and aspirations of the community, the language community, uh, need more. And I think this bill will give the community to the government and to public bodies a policy that would be coordinated to develop the users, the situation of users, and to raise awareness of the culture throughout Scotland for those who use the language. I would like to agree that there, are other, there is other legislation in place already. But they mention things like reasonable adjustments. And how do you define what a reasonable adjustment is? Who decides what is reasonable? Is it us or the people providing the services? Who makes that decision? So I feel that this BSL bill, I really support it because it will depend on, not depend on reasonable adjustments, but real achievements and outcomes. For example, are there occasions when we've gone to hospital, if a doctor asks you, can you lip read? That's happened to us. If someone says yes, they say that's great. That's the reasonable adjustment made. But that's not meeting our needs. And I feel that the BSL Act would stop that, make sure that BSL is provided for people that want it through the use of an interpreter or through other, ki other kinds of information or other ways. I fully support what the other panel members have just said. Um, we do have existing legislation, um, not only the Equality Act and the Disability Discrimination Act before it, and there are other pieces of legislation, but they're piecemeal. There is not one clear uh, statement of intent, if you like, about how deaf people who use British Sign Language access services, and that's the stumbling block. We've already fallen over the stumbling block. I mean, what we have in terms of foreign language provision in this country doesn't, I mean, it far exceeds what we have in British Sign Language, which is a British language. When you try, I mean, if you know the leaflets that get translated throughout the different authorities and service providers. If, if, if we provide equality that way, I mean, from, a, from the deaf British Sign Language community's point of view, we certainly don't have it. And when you look, um, you know, other countries such as you know, the old colonies like Australia and New Zealand, they actually have this recognition in their legislation. And here, back in the so-called mother country, we don't. So we have these uh, old colonies of ours being more progressive, uh, more pioneering than we are. It's been a long way, but it is going to be worth it. We can see what's on the horizon. We. I mean, we, we can see the attitude that the committee has and that the parliament has. We want to see it enshrined in legislation. The hows and the wherefores and the whys can all be uh, done in collaboration and cooperation with the community. Okay, thank you. Just before you bring, I want to bring in James Donner at this point. James, yeah, just to answer a question. Right, okay, thank you. Uh, I've got a question about uh, unintended consequences of the bill. There was a number of comments that suggested that there, there could be some unintended consequences that would create a detrimental effect on the available resources to support people with other communications need, primarily roundabout resources. Uh, do you have a view on that? Could, we, could other uh, forms of communication be negatively affected by the BSL bill? And if so, in what way? I mean, I, I, I think all of the, all of the responses that, that people have uh, given earlier in the day have indicated that th there is a, a very clear understanding and appreciation and recognition that resources are limited and they will always be limited. And the bill, as it's framed, 
uh, doesn't demand that any particular level or quantity of re or sum of resources become available. It simply says, from the available resources, may we please ensure that there is a focus when necessary on BSL. Uh, and the other thing that I think is absolutely critical is that the community is saying to you, and I think Avril articulated it very clearly earlier on today, <coughs> that it, it is a willing partner uh, in working closely with government and with COSLA and with all of the relevant authorities to manage those expectations and use the resources appropriately. It's not asking for a lion's share of resources. It's not asking for anything disproportionate. Simply to make sure that what's available is used effectively and is used in ways that, that, that the community believes will be of benefit. I think, I think perhaps I could um, use a further example. I mean, to go back to the Gaelic um, comparison, which I think is, is, is vital um, within this context, the Scottish Parliament has already recognised that Gaelic is part of the rich cultural heritage of this country, and we should do likewise with British Sign Language. They are comparable in this way. Now, there's been quite a lot of resources um, given to Gaelic, quite rightly, in terms of television, uh, other services, provisions and programmes, and one, one could just say, look, it's only fair. Now, we don't expect things tomorrow. We understand that this is a process. Um, we, you, you've, I mean, the deaf community uh, has waited, like I said, this long. So f I guess from our point of view in Scotland, you know, I mean, of course there will be extra resources required, but let's think about this positively and cooperatively, more strategically, um, so that you have true partnership between community, uh, government, and service providers. Um, the legislation that, that, that exists um, this, this new bill isn't going to put very onerous financial responsibilities. What it might do is just give clarity and focus in a centralised way so that the systems that we have um, already in place are better coordinated and the money and the resources that we have are better spent and focused. I don't think it will have a detrimental effect on, on other provisions. Mm -hmm. I think it will be positive actually for them because as we raise awareness of deafness generally, it will have a positive effect on other forms of deafness. Uh, for example, lips reading, deaf-blind communication and so on. I think it will generally raise awareness and really benefit uh, other members of the, the deaf communities. Can I just make one quick addition before, before we move to Professor Dunbar? Thank you. Um, the British government in 2003 uh, considered this issue uh, of British Sign Language. Um, they decided not to enshrine it in legislation at that time. Um, they did give it a, a recognition, um, and we were delighted at the time, but nothing has actually happened since then. There was a small pool of money and this kind of a very tokenistic recognition, and there was a great deal of disappointment in the community stemming from that. So we're, we're, we're sitting here 12 years later, where, you know, if you're talking about... Um, uh, government expenditure and you compare it, um, it, I mean, it's been about five million across the whole of the UK um, since then. It's not been well done, not well uh, coordinated, and that's because there was no true involvement of community in that and no real commitment. So, I'm, I don't know if you're, you're probably aware by now, there's the Spit the Dummy campaign, which has been set up as a reaction to the fact that, I think it was a decade after the, the, the legislation, that nothing had, had really been happened. But what the deaf community has been given is these little tokenistic sweeteners to pacify them and to really to shut us up in a sense. And I would hate to see a replication of that here, um, where a, a small amount of money is given tr kind of directly, but doesn't have a big effect. We have stated we are willing to work with government and services to make more cost-effective, centralised, smart, strategic ways of meeting our needs. President Barr. Uh, Thank you. I belong to Canada originally, and in Canada they are accustomed to uh, bilingualism at a national level, and many of the arguments used when parliaments bring in laws on additional languages, the, anguish, the argument is about extra cost and the, the, the effect of these costs on other services. In Canada and to an extent in Scotland, there is some additional cost involved in bilingualism uh, in the first place. 
but that's uh, for historical reasons. There was never uh, services or training uh, uh, here previously, but uh, in, uh, with the passage of time, these costs are reduced. And as well as that, when public bodies get accustomed to providing services in another language, it's much easier to do that with additional languages. For example, in Toronto, where I was born, bilingualism at a national level took, had an effect on the development of additional languages. It's a multicultural city, many languages spoken, but there is more and more services uh, available through other languages because people and public bodies don't look on multilingual services as a, uh, something wrong or um, causing problems. And I think as we develop our uh, use of languages and being accustomed to languages in Scotland, so we're more likely to offer these services without doubling the costs as we anticipate for additional services for other language communities. Can, sorry, can, can I just pick up Professor De Barr in, in, in his statement there? Um, as an aside, I represent the Parliament in Brussels, on the Committee of the Regions. I spend quite a lot of time in Brussels using headphones and uh, translation services. One of the big arguments in Brussels every time I go there is about the vast cost of translation. At no point has it seemed to have reduced in any way whatsoever. In fact, one of the arguments uh, in these times of austerity is about the amount of money that's spent on, well, as part of the budget on translation services and interpretation. I mean, are, are you really saying that, you know, realistically this, this could be um, kept to a minimal cost and effectively would reduce over time? Because that's not what I see when I go to Brussels. Uh, in Brussels, the <clears throat> costs are associated with uh, translation of European acts, uh, translation services in many languages for parliamentarians, for Europeans, for people in the Commission, etc. And that is a little uh, different to providing services to the community. For example, education. People talk about the additional uh, costs of Gaelic medium education, but if you were looking at uh, Gaelic medium education differently, we're not talking about costing extra money on Gaelic, but on education. It's just through the medium of a different language. And that is true about many other services, for example, health services. When somebody needs services through another language, they, they get it. They get the same service, but through the medium of another language. There are costs associated with the training of people with uh, skills to deliver these services, but there isn't the same sort of uh, multi-cost, uh, uh, as, uh, as is the case with translation of parliamentary acts, etc. And I don't think that would be at the top of uh, uh, the community's priorities in relation to British Sign Language. Oh, sorry, Professor Tom. Just to say, I mean, I think... Um, <coughs> We've, we've, we've heard a lot, and there's a lot in the evidence about, about concerns about the cost of interpreting. <clears throat> and I think one of the beauties of the bill, uh, as, it's, as it's specified, is that it does uh, refer us to, or encourage us to think both about access to services, which might, for example, mean the use of interpreters, but also about promotion of the language. And it's the, on the promotion side <coughs> that we can do an awful lot more than we have been doing, which will mean that the costs of interpreting uh, don't have to escalate. 
And the rationale for that is the one that the deaf community has consistently articulated generation after generation. And that is, rather than using interpreters, we would wish to have services provided to us directly in BSL, preferably by other people who are members of the signing community themselves. So if promotion begins with uh, educating families in using sign language so that deaf children have uh, the best possible start from the home with their families, then those deaf children have the best chance to grow up to be highly competent skilled professionals like Clark and Carly and Avril. And you've, you've, you've heard and seen the, the, the quality of the evidence that they've given you. <clears throat> and so I think it's very clear uh, that it's perfectly possible to imagine a deaf community that is making that kind of contribution to Scottish society across the board. It starts with the promotion and the access issues uh, will, will need to be maintained, but they will stay in their place. Thank you. Um, I'll bring back in Siobhan and interrupt you, Siobhan. No, thank you. Um, Firstly, I'll finish on James. James had to leave, and so the question that he was asking other panel members were whether the bill should include specific reference to the needs of deaf-blind BSL users, and if so, in what way? Do you have an opinion on that? I think it's a, obviously a very important issue. Um, I have many friends and colleagues that are in fact deaf-blind. Now, we want to be very clear. When we use the expression deaf-blind, there's a difference between deaf-blind and blind-deaf. Because we talk about deaf-blind people as belonging to our community and, and who have lost their sight. The blind deaf people are those that were referred to by the second panel of growing up with English and then uh, losing their hearing. And those two groups are very distinct, in fact, almost opposite needs. Because you can imagine somebody who grows up with perfectly good sight and loses uh, their sight for a number of different health reasons, the most prevalent in our community being Usher syndrome. Um, about 6% of the deaf community um, have um, this retinitis pigmentosa uh, plus deafness uh, syndrome. Um, so that's a substantial number. So they already use sign language and then encounter these difficulties later and need tactile hands-on and a number of different communication issues. It's essential that the bill ad addresses them as equals, equal participants in all of this. Sassley also has a group of deaf-blind interpreters, and we feel very strongly that that's part of our community, uh, people who can communicate using um, hands-on signing and, and manual. They're an equal part of our community, and we work in partnership with them as well. On the first, before we move to James, it was simply, um, Carly, you spoke in your evidence uh, about how the second panel spoke about disability and disabled rather than seeing this as a language issue, which um, Professor Dunbar spoke about, the cultural aspects of it. I'm just wondering, do you think this bill will go a long way to putting BSL as a language rather than seen as a disability issue? I believe it really will change attitudes of people generally who know very little about BSL in society. At the moment, people learning BSL um, are perhaps meeting their, um, a deaf person for the very first time. They're, they're being able to learn the language and they don't have that mind view. They think of it as a, a disability first. So I believe that once BSL becomes much more widespread and people learn the language earlier and younger, at, at a younger age, mm. it will influence the attitudes of people and people will see BSL as a language rather than just a way of communicating and not just a, a disability tool. It's something very separate for us. Um, I mean, our hearing peers help us, they can sign. Um, but in general society, we feel it's very separate. If I could just add to what Carly said. <clears throat> right. We've heard this morning, you heard earlier this morning, you know, that the, the, deaf, the deaf community doesn't accept this disability label and sees herself as a linguistic um, minority or community. Um, but you can actually, there doesn't need to be an either or in there. I mean, clearly we're not going to say, we're not disabled. We understand that we can't hear and that provides barriers in terms of how we access community, access society. But it's the secondary issue to us. The bill recognises that we put our language, identity and culture first. We, reckon, we accept our disability in society, but it's important that, it's, that, that, that the, what the bill does is puts the language first, and that is right. Okay. That recognises our linguistic minority identity. That's why you've had a, a lot of evidence and submissions on Facebook from deaf people, people who really recognise that that's important for us. 
OK, thank you. Um, I'm going to have to ask committee members and panellists to try and be brief, if at all possible. Uh, Colin. Um, I'd like to explore the effectiveness of the Gaelic Language Act in promoting Gaelic. And are there any useful lessons learned that could be included in the BSL Bill? Um, I think there are lessons to be learned from the Gaelic Language Act and putting it into effect. In many ways, it's, it's a little early to be certain about the effect of the Act. It came in in 2006. The first plans were made in 2007, 2008, so the, the history of the Act is relatively short. I think especially the effect that the plans and the Act had on education is particularly relevant, and education about Gaelic and education in Gaelic, very important. That is very important in promoting Gaelic and the language and the British Sign Language similarly. I think also, as we can see in this parliament, through uh, signage, through advertisements, Gaelic is much more visible. And because of that, people know about that the language exists, that it's spoken, and there is a better identity and acceptance in Scotland that there is a, a, a multicultural community in Scotland and a, a, a living community. And I think these things are more important. Also, I don't think enough stress was put on services through the medium of Gaelic. In my opinion, there's a little too much emphasis on translation, uh, annual reports and things like that. Things that are important without doubt to raise the status of the language. But I think if there had been more emphasis on services for the people who use Gaelic, that is very important and that's where I would have put the priority and also from the evidence we heard today and from the written evidence that is uh, also very important. So it has raised awareness and understanding in the community about the language and the culture. Very important <laughs> education in Gaelic and also learners of the language and also services, how we can deliver better services in the language and that is very important to our community. I'm, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the Martin Luther King speech, We Have a Dream, and I'll tell you now, like every other human being, we have dreams in this, in this regard. And in terms of what Professor Dunbar was talking about services and what's going on in television and, and so on and so forth, there is actually some British Sign Language provision in television, and there are um, uh, some aspects of, uh, uh, you know, cultural programming, such as not, not see here is the name of a television program, not the report, by the way, there's two different see here's. Um, so that's actually been going since, I think, 1981, one of the longest standing community programs in the world in existence, where other, or other programs come and go. This flagship of the BBC has been widely recognised as an essential service. So we pay the same television licence as everybody else. So it's quite right that we expect, you know, perhaps not equity of service, but it, I mean, it's, it's only half an hour a week. Um, and only for 20 weeks a year, but it's vital because it's that cultural expression of deaf people that allows us to identify with you know, the cultural institutions and artifacts, celebrate our life, our language, our culture, not be sad, not be hidden in the corner, depressed as disabled people, to celebrate and enjoy our deaf heart, our theater, our poems, all those things that we can contribute and add to the multicultural life in Britain. In 1989, uh, 
Um, uh, again, to, uh, to congratulate the BBC, you know, they, they set up a, a programming to allow people to learn sign language, you know? So in instead of looking at these courses, you know, we, we, you know, we know that, that people in Britain struggle to learn French and German everywhere, but with an accompanying book and a program, they had a really popular program. I mean, there was a bit of a... I mean, you could, I suppose you could look, we have such a beautiful, vibrant, exciting language to learn. I mean, we could have seen the floodgates open, I suppose. Um, and, and in fact, they kind of did, you know, as a result of that program, but in a positive, in a progressive way. And it was res the responsibility of the deaf community to respond to that. And we did respond to that by training British Sign Language tutors to meet this hugely explosive need. And uh, s simple um, individuals, well, I mean, Princess Diana uh, was a great um, advocate and ambassador for British Sign Language by being the patron of the British Deaf Association. You know, that she raised the profile of our language because she could sign a little bit um, and provided such a great role model. Um, I mean, that, that encouraged even more people to come to our community. It promoted BSL in, in, a, in, in the most wonderful way. We've talked about existing legislation and adding to it and, and uh, uh, perhaps t you know what's working and what's not working. You know, and with the with the Broadcasting Act, you know, there's a hundred percent requirement for uh, captioning, which is very important for that huge uh, hearing impaired, hard of hearing community whose first language is English. But for people who who don't access the world through English. Uh, the deaf community very much struggled. You know, we have in-vision interpreters, and, and that was part of the legislation, giving us at five percent of all television programming across all channels. So, when you work that out, that's 94 hours a week, which is which is good and positive in its own right. But do you know when those programs are broadcast? Two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Um, that not highly visible, not celebrating their language, not putting it out there. So, you know, unless, you've got, unless you're a deaf insomniac, um, you're not going to be taking advantage of that. Now, the education issue is the most important. Um, now, obviously, we'd love to see it. Look, I, I have a dream of a BSL channel, yeah, but it might not be a reality, but I'd like to get up at 7 o'clock in the morning, just like my hearing counterparts, and access what's going on in the world. Home affairs, foreign affairs, get my access directly through sign language. And then, you know, go to, go to work at 9 o'clock, and I'd, I'd like my kids to be able to access children's programming in the or, or educational programming, to have that suite of services available in a very cost-effective way. Allowing, you know, leisure programs as well, <laughs> chat shows, of course we want that kind of equity, we have those kind of needs, um, but the, the, it, the cultural life of deaf people is to be celebrated, you know, it, it, it is a dream, but it's actually an achievable dream over time. I really am going to have to move on because we've got an awful lot of no questions to get through in virtually no time at all. Um, Gordon. Um, I want to ask you about the content of BSL plants similar to the questions that I asked to the two previous panels. So what should be included in both national and authority plans in order that the plans can be effective? And should there be some detail on the content of plans included in the bill? Um, <coughs> well, to take the second question first. <coughs> Uh, no, I think the, the, the way the bill is constructed is entirely appropriate uh, because we don't want to uh, prejudge uh, what the climate might be, what resources might be available, what the priorities might be for uh, successive governments. Uh, and so uh, the bill as constructed sets a framework, gives us an opportunity to uh, take the priorities of the day uh, and that's as it should be. So I don't think there's any, uh, there's any strong lobby asking for more detail of the plans to be put in onto the face of the bill. The key thing, I think, about uh, the nature of the planning process is that it is a, a, a participatory process. Um, and you know, I was delighted to see the, uh, the One Scotland uh, work program for, for the Scottish Government referring quite clearly to government uh, Paragraph 238, uh, we want to draw more people more deeply into the way that decisions that matter to them are taken. We want Scotland to be an open and truly engaging country where the creativity and wisdom of all its people help to shape our future. 
That's exactly what the deaf community is asking you for. <coughs> uh, and so a, a planning process that affords the BSL uh, using community the, the, the opportunity to make that kind of contribution, to engage in civic activism in exactly the kind of way that the, uh, that the program uh, uh, is, uh, is anticipated to achieve uh, is, precisely, is precisely what the community is, is talking about. And I think you know, all of this... Um, put some of the discussion uh, earlier in the day in a very different light. As soon as we start talking about the comparison between BSL and Gaelic, we're a long, long way away from asking questions about uh, 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 disability and, and, and resources around disability. Nobody, for example, asks, um, can we afford to support Gaelic because Makaton users will be disadvantaged? Yeah. Uh, and I think, that, I think that gives us a clear idea about being in different territory altogether as soon as we start seeing BSL users as a linguistic minority. And I would say then that we're also encouraged to, to recognise that we're not talking about deaf people's needs. Don't, don't do this because deaf people need you to do it. Do it because Scotland wants it, because Scotland will be a better nation for it. Okay. Anybody else want to come on? Yeah. I could say a word or two about the Gaelic Language Act. It is somewhat similar to this bill. There isn't a lot in, in the Gaelic Language Act about the substance of plans, but there are two things in this plan, uh, bill that are very important, and I think even ahead of uh, uh, the Gaelic Act. Firstly, the bill says that public bodies should seek uh, advice, uh, consult with uh, users of the language, and I think that's very important. I think that advice uh, but is good, but also uh, longer-lasting consultation as well. Also, the bill tries to to fit in the national plans with the public bodies' plans, and I think that link is very important too. Under the Gaelic Act, uh, Borna Gaelic uh, have the power to issue guidance uh, to public authorities, and they have done that. I think that would also have been useful for public bodies since. Uh, they, they, they're not very sure about what sort of, um, what kind of plans to prepare. So I think some guidance on that at a national level would be useful uh, after the Act comes into effect. So I think these two principles, advice and consultation, um, is very important and to do the uh, to link the planning at a national level and at a local level okay, thanks very much. okay uh, liam Thank you very much um you'll have heard you've heard all the questions from the previous panels and this is probably going to come as a huge surprise um uh, the, the issue uh, in the bill in relation to a minister with specific responsibility for uh, BSL. Uh, obviously, you'll be aware the, the Scottish Government have expressed some reservations, seeing this more as a, an issue of collective responsibility, albeit an issue that would sit within a portfolio and therefore fall to a, a particular minister to, to, to drive forward. I'd be interested if you have any firm views uh, either way, um, if it is a, a minister responsible what the, the specific duties on that minister would be. Uh, and then in addition, the, the, the idea of a national advisory uh, group made up of um, obviously ministers, uh, local authorities, uh, other um, service uh, providers, but also, also service users. And I think within the BSL community, there's a firm view that the majority of that group should be made up of, of, uh, of service users. And again, it'd be helpful if, um, if we could have your views on um, the makeup of that, the desirability of such a group. Sashley does agree with the view that we do need to have an advisory group and with the majority of BSL users um, within that group. The regions of Scotland are, are very diverse between north, south, the central belt is very different. 
um, north of Scotland is much more rural and has different needs and services. So you need to be able to include people from the regions that can express those different needs within the advisory group. And the lead minister should be there. There should be someone who's there who's accountable, who can take the work forward and then cascade it down to different ministers and different departments. They should also be, have a, a, a strong understanding of BSL within their work. It shouldn't be an afterthought. The minister should be taking the lead on that and then cascading it down to others. We don't want it to be an afterthought for that minister. And we want the, the minister to be proactive in making sure that things actually happen as a result of, of the act. And yeah, feedback from the advisory board is, is really, really important in, in that whole process. Could I, as the MSP for Orkney, please welcome the fact that um, that expression of the regional diversity um, it, it being explicitly set out. But in terms of the ministerial responsibility, I think one of the ideas from the previous panel was that we have a minister for languages at the moment, including uh, the Gaelic language. Is this something that uh, you would see comfortably sitting within that remit, or does it need to be more explicitly drawn out? <coughs> for that? I, first of all, I strongly support what Carly says about recognising the regional diversity of this country. Um, your question is, should it be one single minister or should it be cross-department responsibility? I think you've already identified that if there isn't one single minister and you put it across all the departments, the level of expertise, knowledge and background between those departments is going to vary wildly. So that one, may, one department may well be addressing the needs very well and others very much not doing that case. So you can see the pitfalls and the, the potential failures in that system. Whereas if you have one uh, department or minister ultimately accountable, being supported uh, with a clear remit um, by a, a, an advisory group with expertise, we would see that as the best way of working. I think um, uh, the conversations that uh, have been happening in the lead up to the bill uh, have, have been broadly very um, clear that uh, the community is, is quite relaxed about uh, the Scottish Government's uh, position that there is a shared responsibility. That's the way it needs to be. Uh, equally, as you say, it would be slightly absurd, having recognised that there is a particular linguistic minority, uh, if the minister who's responsible for languages didn't have some kind of uh, uh, role or, or, or position in kind of championing the language, if you like. Um, the only other thing I would say about the, about the advisory panel, and of course there'll be a lot of uh, conversation to be had if the bill is successful about the exact composition of that panel and so on, uh, that I don't think needs to be decided today or in, in the immediate future. <coughs> but I would just say that, um, of course, we, we, we pick you up, if I may, on the terminology talking about uh, uh, deaf people being part of that panel as service users. Yeah? <coughs> their contribution to that panel is a great deal broader than as service users. If we think of deaf people as service users only, then we're fixating on the access, uh, access issues uh, and losing the focus on promotion and the contribution that the community can make to society in Scotland. I took my reprimand in this book, <laughs> which is intended. Well, you know, I mean, it's not usual, but uh, it's uh, kind of you to do so. Okay. Can I just go back to Professor Dumbar, though? Um, obviously, you're well aware of the process that was undertaken in when we went through the Gaelic Language Bill and then the introduction of the Act. Um, from that experience, um, can you give us some uh, information, background, knowledge about how uh, the introduction of plans was, were introduced, how the development of those plans was a particularly onerous process on um, uh, bodies to produce plans, and also in relation to what we've just discussed about um, ministerial responsibility, national advisory boards, etc. I just wondered if you could give us some background uh, with your experience in the Gaelic issue. Perhaps uh, I should start with uh, the ministerial responsibility for the bill for the language. We have had uh, a minister since 1999, since the first day the Scottish Parliament was created, a responsibility for Gaelic. Now he has responsibility for Scottish language, Scotland's languages. I think it's important that someone has uh, responsibility uh, ministerially within government for this. It's important. I think Gaelic and the Gaelic community have been very important with, very fortunate with uh, 
the ministers they've had, Alistair Allen is very um, familiar with the language, he's familiar with the issues concerning the means and the needs of Gaelic and other languages and as what he learns in relation to policy and putting policy into effect for Gaelic would be very useful in relation to policy for other languages. So I think that has been important to Gaelic that there was a, a minister in government with specific responsibility for Gaelic matters. In relation to plans, I think the plans have been successful. Borden Gaelic has worked closely with public bodies. And in addition to just uh, asking them to prepare plans, the board uh, gives advice and support to public bodies, and I think that's important. <coughs> since the, there won't be uh, a, a board or a, an equivalent body under this bill i think uh, the government should think about how they will consult um, keep in co touch with people in relation to advice and guidance i think the advice that Board Gaelic have given has been useful and some of the doubts that uh, were expressed by some public bodies have been much reduced now with the knowledge they have of the process um, as a consequence of the, the, the support they get from the government and also from the board. So I think a system of uh, advice and guidance to public bodies is very important in reducing some of the doubts that they may have and some of the difficulties they may envisage with these responsibilities. Just to, to, to finish us off this morning, um, it takes up from a point just raised by Professor Dunbar on consultation. The Scottish Government has suggested that uh, the BSL National Advisory Group can undertake collective consultation on authority plans for a number of reasons, not least because um, it's slightly concerned, I think, about pressure put on um, uh, individuals and groups to provide advice and uh, review those plans. What are the panel's views on that suggestion? Professor Turner? Uh, on the suggestion of, of statements as, as No, 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 on, on collective consultation. Uh, well, as, as I've indicated, I, 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 I think there is there is a spirit abroad in the in the country as a whole uh, of consultation, and uh, I, I think it was shown very clearly. And I think the country as a whole is very proud of uh, the 85 percent turnout in the referendum last year. This is a country that uh, values that spirit of consultation, uh, and I think that's that's what we're looking to take forward. Uh, I I mean, I think the, the key thing to add here is that we all enter the process looking for a, a long-term uh, re response to these kinds of uh, issues. Uh, these are not things that can be addressed in the short term. We've had uh, uh, plenty of evidence to so, show that uh, attempts to do so uh, have been unsuccessful one way or another. Uh, so it is an incremental process. It is a process of continuous improvement uh, and, a, and a process where, uh, where, where the community is very keen to, to engage and participate. I think uh, perhaps the key thing to bear in mind is that uh, contrary to some of the evidence, again, that we've heard earlier today, I, mean, I, I invite you to review the evidence that's been submitted uh, uh, to, to the committee to date uh, and ask you whether you find very many instances in there in which deaf people themselves describe the services available to them as exemplary. We heard earlier on that exemplary services were out there. So do deaf people tell you that the services are exemplary? I don't think so very often. So there is a process of continuous improvement that, that the community is looking for, <coughs> but it enters into that willingly and in a spirit of partnership. Well, that, that may be true, Professor Turner, what you say about exemplary services, but I have to say my experience is that not many people come to me about exemplary services as an MSP <laughs> across the board, so <laughs> that, may not be, that may not be the case that we get that end of the, the spectrum. Just one final question to the panel, um, and it's a fairly straightforward one. I've asked the others. It's about the... 
whether they believe there are advantages in moving to either a five or a seven year cycle for the national plan as opposed to the one that's currently laid out in the bill. Well, and the At the moment, public bodies are under an obligation, who are under an obligation to provide a Gaelic language plan will uh, renew that every five years. And I think that's uh, reasonable. It, it takes a, a bit of time to uh, devise the plan and then to put it into effect. And I think it's important that a sufficient amount of time is allowed, especially in relation to language development. It's a kind of complicated matter. Uh, it's not easy to put into effect uh, uh, these things quickly, especially when it comes to training and education. It, it does take time. And I think it's important to allow sufficient time to the, the public bodies to put the, their plans into effect. At the same time, I think if the, if the time is too long, uh, it's likely to, uh, people are likely to leave things undone for some time. So that's the, the danger in having a plan that, that is uh, too long and cycle. I think five years is a reasonable period of time that gives them sufficient time to uh, put their plans into effect and to review what they have done. That's also very important. They must know whether they're doing under the plans is uh, succeeding. Uh, some things might be successful, others maybe not so, and it's quite difficult to uh, discover that if the period of time is too short. So I think it's it's uh, a good idea to give them sufficient time before the next one comes on board. I do agree with Professor Dunbar, but also I think we have to get the view of, of deaf people. For too long we've been sidelined, we've been marginalised, um, and we haven't been involved in the process for so long for parliamentary issues, council issues and so on. So I think we need to give deaf people time to make that adjustment in their own mindset, a cultural change, if you like, an attitudinal change. So maybe extending that time would be beneficial um, to, to, to do it in phases, to have a phased approach to it, and rather than rushing things through, because that might lead to the whole process breaking down. So I would recommend a more measured approach for sure. I'd just like to re-emphasize what Carly said. It's a fair point to be made. You know, is it five or seven years, an appropriate time frame? It's difficult to say at this point in time. I think the Gaelic experience is instructive and informative because <coughs> in our discussions, you know, when you think about five years, you think, oh, well, it's quite a long time, isn't it? Especially in an individual's lifespan. Um, however, there are some long-term goals and aspirations that we would like to see expressed. I think, you know, the, because of the existing legislation that we've talked about before, and you know, we're not starting from a, from a, a, a point of, of the ground up. Uh, it, the deaf community does have a different, slightly different experience from the Gaelic experience in, in some ways. In that, um, you know, our access to core police health services is very sporadic, piecemeal, and not. Uh, it, it, it's not uniform. So we, I think Carly's idea of a phased um, process might work better, whereby, um, you know, with, in some areas you can imagine changes in education would take much longer than than face-to-face -face changes in, in social services on a local level. So um, it's, it's about what's workable. And w we're prepared as the deaf community to work with you and to be a lot more complex and not see it as a black and white issue, a lot more uh, gray in there that, that's to be discussed. Thank the panel um, very much for coming along. I was going to say this morning, but it's now this afternoon. Um, uh, thank you very much for your time and for your uh, evidence in this morning. Um, we've obviously got a lot of things to consider um, uh, when we're looking at the bill. But uh, just for everybody's information, the, our next consideration of the BSL bill will be on the 17th of March, when we will take evidence from the Scottish Government and from the member in charge of the bill, Mark Griffin. So that's 17th of March for the next uh, evidence session on the BSL bill. And with that, um, I, I will close the meeting.